This happened to me when I was in fourth grade. I am now 42. The internet as we know it wasn't around back in those days. So unfortunately I don't have any news articles to corroborate my story. But I have a very vivid memory of what happened that day. The day that my friend nearly lost her innocence and possibly her life. Here is the backstory. I have always had this very weird habit that I still do to this very day. I don't know what causes it, but I've always walked on my tiptoes. When I would go to school, I would usually get picked on a lot for this. No matter how much I tried walking flat-footed, I always ended up back on my toes. This led my family to believe that I was destined to be a ballet dancer. As much as I love to dance, I was also a tomboy that preferred climbing trees to wearing dresses. So when my mother, who worked two jobs, took me to the community center and signed me up for ballet classes, I thought I would definitely have to learn how to like dresses. The dance instructor's name was Mulaney. She was impressed by my skills but wasn't crazy about my height or my parents' economic status, as this was a very expensive class. At the end of my audition, I was told that I was too tall and awkward. It was a nice way of building up a young girl's confidence. When I exited the classroom and entered the hallway, I heard Mulaney say under her breath that she would not teach poor kids. I stopped mid-stride and turned around. Excuse me? And that's when she replied, I don't teach trailer trash, okay? My face became so red that my ears were purple. At that moment, I decided that I would knock her on her pompous ass. Before I could react, that's when I felt a hand on my shoulder, followed by a man's voice. That's a fighter in you. Have you ever thought about trying out karate? Mr. Diaz was a well-known and respected karate instructor in our county. He wanted me to try out his class and even offered to take me in at no charge. I would be his first girl, but he saw my potential and I still owe him a lot for this. When I first started training, he noticed my tiptoed footing, and rather than mock me for it, he showed me how to turn them into weapons, as my legs are, to this day, still solid muscle from my calves to my thighs, and I kick harder than a mule. It was around this time that our small town on the coast of North Carolina was being terrorized by a man who had been abducting young girls. He would take them, have his way with them, and when he was done, he would bind their hands together, blindfold them before crossing into another town and dropping them off in the middle of the night. He was a sick bastard. He didn't kill any of his victims, but his M.O. suggested that he was becoming more and more violent with each incident. Mr. Diaz changed his lessons for a week or two and taught us how to use our momentum against attackers to get away. Eyes, nose, groin, and face. He said that if you were attacked, we should try our best to claw and scratch their face and eyes. Not only would this have the chance of blinding them, but it would also make them easy to identify after the fact. More importantly, he emphasized the buddy system. He told us not to scream the R word, because unfortunately while many people want to stop that from happening, he also said people don't want to see it, and carry that mental image around in their heads. We should scream, fire, or I lost my arm. He said that as silly as the last one sounds, it works. People are compelled to look at a fire, but even more so if someone's arm is falling off. Okay, so now on to the day in question. I was in fourth grade, and the year was 1990, springtime. At the time, I was with my best friend, who we'll call Ginny. Ginny and I decided to take a little walk around the neighborhood we lived in. This neighborhood had two main entrances, and formed a circle with two parallel streets in the middle. Homes were lined along each road, no more than one and a half acres apart, some even closer. It was very easy to come into one entrance, leave out the other, and not be seen by anyone, even if you were paying attention to the vehicles that were passing through. This was also back when we kept the time by looking at the streetlights. The rule was when the streetlights come on, 
Your ass better be on your way home. Jenny and I were on the main road heading towards the back. We were just being a couple of young girls talking about boys that we liked and the boogeyman that had been terrorizing our state. A girl that we knew named Kelly had been the latest victim. She was turned from a social butterfly into a psych ward irregular. She even tried to take her own life at one point. As we were talking about this, I remember looking over my shoulder and seeing an unfamiliar car approaching us very slowly. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. The car was a Pontiac with a faded maroon or burgundy color. The driver almost reminded me of Jeffrey Dahmer. He wore these thick, red-rimmed glasses, had tight blonde, curly hair, and had a smile that made my skin crawl. His window was down already, and he stopped the car beside us. Hello, girls. I'm trying to pay my electric bill, and I can't seem to find the office anywhere. Can you tell me how to get there from here? Coincidentally, the one electric company in our town wasn't even a mile away from our neighborhood. In fact, I could have walked straight through the woods and shown up at the front doorstep. The only way to pay to turn on the service was in the office itself. Again, this was a small town back in the early 90s. The driver continued, saying that he had to get there to avoid his electricity shutting off. Knowing that he had had to have been there before, I stated, It's where you paid to have it turned on, so just go there. That's when I noticed an open map beside him on the passenger seat. He explained that his mother had been the one to turn on the electricity, and he was new to the area, and had just come back from deployment. Something that struck me as odd was that his hair was a bit too long for being in the military, and he didn't have a sticker for getting on base. There are two military bases by us, Camp Lejeune and Cherry Point. Both of my grandfather served in the military. Uh, can you please just show me it here on the map? He beckoned Jenny over to his car. Jenny was obviously unaware that something was off. I looked around and saw that no one was outside, and I quickly turned my attention back to Jenny and the man. The voice of Mr. Diaz echoed in my head. Fight if you can't fly. Something bad will happen to Jenny if you don't. As soon as Jenny gets close enough, a look of pure evil forms on the man's face. Imagine seeing a human transforming into a demonic creature. That's the best way I can describe it. Thanks, sweetie. Just point it out for me right here. He locks eyes with mine and gives me a sickly smile. That's when I quickly grab Jenny. Wait, don't lean in. <coughs> Jenny's scream echoed across the street as I look up and saw that the man had reached over the passenger seat and had a hold of her arm. The car slowly began to roll forward as he struggled to pull her in. I yelled as I wrapped my arms around Jenny's upper body. I then pulled back as hard as I could, and I knew it was going to hurt like a bitch once I fell onto the asphalt, but that was okay, as long as I still had a hold of Jenny. We both hit the road, and it hurt like hell as I predicted. By this time, some of the neighbors heard us screaming and had exited their homes. I pulled Jenny to safety as the car peeled away. One of the bystanders was the mother of my friend Brandon. She got the tags and a detailed description of what the driver looked like and his car. The man that we encountered that day was the monster who had been preying on young girls in North Carolina. I don't recall his name. My mother made every effort to keep me sheltered before this incident, and it just got worse after this. Now that I'm a mother myself, I can understand better now. She was proud of me and my actions that day. Jenny was also very grateful, and I'm glad to say that she's still doing well. The girl that I mentioned earlier, Kelly, serves as an example of what could have became of her if I hadn't intervened that day. 
Kelly has had a rough life and doesn't really speak to anyone anymore. I don't know all the details, but the monster ended up being caged. The descriptions of the car and the driver gathered from my neighborhood aided in his apprehension. I often think back to that day at the community center, where I was scoffed at by someone who thought I wasn't worth the investment. But against all odds, Mr. Diaz saw the potential in a tall, awkward girl who walked on her tiptoes. He was the guiding voice in my head that day, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been able to save Jenny. This took place when I was only seven years old. Back then, my parents would always drop me off at my grandma's house on the weekends. I always looked forward to staying with her. We would always go for walks around the neighborhood and talk to the people that she knew. My grandmother was always a very religious person, and we went to church with many of the people in her neighborhood. It was a very friendly community. They would often host garage sales on the weekends during the warmer months which usually had decent turnouts. On one weekend, my parents decided to go to one of the garage sales with us. I was super excited. We usually just liked to look around and rarely would buy anything. Eventually, we got to a house that had boxes of toys lined all the way down the driveway. The sale was happening at a house that we had never been to before, and we didn't know who lived there. Once I saw all the toys... I thought I had just won the lottery. While I was busy sorting through the newly discovered treasure, my grandma and parents were a few yards away looking at some dishes and furniture and making conversation with some of the other people there. An older man, who looked to be around 60, approached me and watched me sort through the boxes with a smile on his face. My, what a pretty young woman you are. Do you like toys? I eagerly said yes, not thinking anything of it. I was about to leave to go ask my mom if I could buy a toy horse that I found. But before I could go, he said that he would let me have it for free and gave it to me with a grin on his face. He started picking a few other toys out of the boxes and handing them over to me, insisting that I could have all the toys I wanted. He told me that he had way more toys inside of his house that I could play with as well, and that I should go with him. Before I knew it, I was being led into his house. My mom then came up behind me and pulled me away from him, and then asked what the hell was going on. She was furious, holding me tightly and staring daggers at the man. She must have seen what was happening just in time and intervened. My dad and grandma were right behind her. The man said nothing while my mom and grandma started screaming at him. And this caught the attention of every other bystander. And everyone was immediately suspicious. I don't remember what was said, because my dad scooped me up in his arms and took me back to the car. I remember my grandma calling the police before we left. I didn't understand the gravity of the situation at the time. I found out many years later that the man had gone to the same church as my grandma and had participated in a lot of the events hosted by the church, including the youth events. Apparently, the police found loads of child pornography on his computer and was sent to prison shortly after. I'm 19 now, and it still creeps me out thinking about what could have happened to me if my mother didn't see what was going on. Thank God she did. Back in 2001, I worked for a major home improvement warehouse. Let's just say the company I worked for had a thing for the color orange. By then I had been with the company for about 8 years. My previous position was with HR, an assistant to the regional and store managers. The company eliminated that position, so I asked to be transferred to the RTV department, which stands for Return to Vendor. The girl who was working in that position gave her two weeks notice, so the timing was perfect. The job was to work with the different vendors to get credit back to the store for defective merchandise. 
Our company had a pretty liberal return policy back in 2001, and some people brought back some strange things like garbage disposal units infested with maggots, old plug-in drills that weren't even being manufactured, you could always tell by the serial numbers, defective lawnmowers, and half-put-together shelves. I've seen it all. My RTV cage, as they called it, was located in the receiving department at the back of the store. It was a 12-foot high chain-link fence with a swinging door entrance, which I would lock when I would go on lunch break or checked out for the day. I had my computer up on a makeshift stand, where I would process the credits and have vendors sign off on them. You wouldn't be able to see into the cage from outside due to all the bins holding the defective merchandise. One day a vendor came in for some defective molding. I was standing at my computer with my back towards the guy as he inspected the merchandise. Both the product and mine apparently. He then told me, I'll give you credit for everything here. I was about to turn around and say, awesome, thanks, but was surprised with a flesh-colored, wrinkled, phallic-shaped hardware hanging out of his zipper. And he just stood there with his hands on his hips so that I knew it didn't just fall out. I turned around back to my computer and I felt faint. I thought, did that just happen? Without turning back around, I handed him the RTV paper to sign, and he said, See you in a couple weeks. I took some time in the cage to compose myself, and then walked to the manager's office and informed him about the situation. I also called the MOD, they like their acronyms, and his reply was, Well, what do you expect? And then started laughing. Since this was 20 years ago, I'll go ahead and say that I was pretty cute back then. Tan, fit, always had my hair and makeup done. No matter what I looked like, I didn't expect that from someone I had to do business with. The MOD insinuated that I should expect and accept treatment like that from time to time, and they weren't going to do anything about it. I called the company that the hot dog flasher worked for, and they said, uh, we'll look into it. Fast forward a few weeks later, and a co-worker approached me and asked, Did you hear? That molding dude did the same thing to a cashier. Now he can't come back into the store anymore. So, that son of a bitch didn't get fired? <laughs> Apparently not. Looking back on this whole thing, I should have sued them. I'd probably be rich by now. Maybe I should have just laughed and said, That's all you've got? I've seen bigger ones on newborn babies. But hindsight is always 2020. In the moment, I froze, because that was the last thing I ever expected to happen. This happened in late October of last year in Ottawa, Ontario. I was visiting my old city to see my parents, which is always a strenuous endeavor. So I generally try to be in their house as little as possible when I'm over. To kill some boredom one night, I decided to go for a jog around the neighborhood I grew up in, around 10.30 p.m. I was really pushing myself as I quit drinking and was desperately trying to burn off the excess belly fat from being drunk and lazy during lockdown. I ran basically a huge circuit around the neighborhood, taking me through three parks. The third park I had to run through has no street lights. It has one right in the middle, but Ottawa has a thing where random lights shut off and this alternates across the city's power grid to save money and electricity. Nine times out of ten, it isn't shining. Now, this park is extremely dark especially on a quiet October night, with clear skies and dry ground. The road leading into it is well illuminated. This is a quaint, quiet, peaceful suburb. There has been some sketchy stuff that has happened in this little suburb, though. For example, just a six-minute walk from my parents' house was one of the biggest drug busts our city has ever seen. 
some gang with automatic illegal weapons, the whole shebang. There were also a couple of stabbings in other areas, but very spaced apart and generally resolved by the law immediately. All in all, it's a very quaint, safe, and clean place to raise a family. If I ever have kids or retire, Kanata would be an ample place to do it. I have never once felt unsafe, especially in the neighborhood my parents lived in, as it's full of some very nice houses. Through the darkness, I entered the park and passed through the first part of it, which is a play structure meant for little kids. Pretty much just a wooden mini house that's next to a bouncy spring. This leads to a bigger part of the park with a basketball court, jungle gym, and a much larger play structure with a big, green triceratops made of plastic in the sandbox. All this eventually leads to a path that runs behind my old elementary school. At the end of this path is my street. I almost finished my run, running through the dark, spooky park, as I have passed through hundreds of times before. Now, I got into the habit of falling asleep to creepy stories and have been watching a lot of horror movies lately. As I'm breaking into the blackness from the adjacent street, leading into the park, I am on the fence about taking a break and walking, but I remember I was trying to push myself. I carry on as I think, jokingly to myself. Gee, I sure hope nothing spooky happens. But as I am rounding the corner to the other half of the park, I heard a distant scraping sound. I noticed a light from somebody's cell phone shining in the sandbox. As I ran closer, I heard this scraping getting louder. I got even closer, and I noticed through the moonlight that it is a man holding one of those hard rakes with the sharp tines, grooming the sandbox. Now, some internal intuition told me that I know this is super weird. Why is there some guy grooming the sandbox at almost 11 p.m. with a flashlight? As I approach further, however, I notice it isn't just a man holding a sharp rake. It's a man wearing an all-black sweatsuit, with the hood up, and a white hospital mask. He is standing underneath the play structure, using the tines of the rake to push a pink horse with wheels on it back and forth, and so on and so forth. He heard the stride of my footsteps approaching, and his head jerked upright in my direction. He quickly moved out from underneath the play structure and shined the light on me, right into my eyes. This is really weird. I thought to myself as I flashed him an utterly exhausted, awkward wave. I have asthma, and my quads and lungs are giving out. I try super hard to up the pace, because I am fairly creeped out at this point. In a flash, he kills his light, and I cannot see a single thing anymore. My heart jumps into my throat, and I am very tuckered out at this point, ready to collapse. I heard a soft shuffling in the sand as I passed him, followed by rapid footsteps in between my strides getting closer and louder. Instantaneously it clicks that this guy is charging me with the rake. It's crazy what fear and adrenaline can do, because I went from zero to a hundred real quick, sprinting faster than I would be able to normally. My whole body is burning, especially my lungs, as I cleared the park onto the well-lit path. I was moving so fast and panting so loud, I couldn't even tell if he was following me or not. I didn't look back. I cleared the end of the path and saw some guy getting out of his car. With him as my witness, I turned around, panting myself to death and wheezing. He was gone. I walked back to my street and went into my house, hacking up disgusting amounts of phlegm, absolutely drenched in sweat. I avoided telling my parents this story at first, just to avoid their reaction, but everyone else in my life knew pretty quick. I don't care for police, so calling them wasn't even something that crossed my mind. Later, when I reconnected with an old friend, one who never left Ottawa, she informed me that my old elementary school converts to a homeless shelter at night. They set up cots in the gymnasium and kicked them out at 6 a.m. Her reaction was to rationalize that it was probably a mentally ill, 
homeless person who was bored and couldn't sleep. But what if he had a different intention? Was he waiting for a jogger to pass by? Was he trying to scare people just for the fun of it? Or was he really in a violent mood? I guess I will never know. This happened back in 2014 with a few friends and I during the winter. I was 13 years old when this happened, and it's by far the creepiest and most dangerous situation I've ever been in. At the time, my family and I lived in a widely popular town of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Life was kind of like what you'd expect from Massachusetts. It snowed a lot and only got a bit warmer during the summer months. The winters here were almost brutal, to the point where you wouldn't want to go outside, even with warm clothing. One day during the peak of winter, my school had closed due to the weather, and because of that, I had invited two of my friends over, Josh and Shane. They were around my age as well, with Shane being a little older, but still in the same range. We almost never have snow days, so we knew we had to make the most of it. We started playing some video games on the Xbox, all the way to eventually playing hide and go seek in the basement. My house has this really nice spacious basement that had all sorts of things, like a pool table, a living room area, and even a mini theater. My parents were asleep upstairs, and we didn't want to cause any noise, so the basement was the ideal place for us. We all decided that we'd play hide and seek to just pass the time. Seeing as to how big this basement was, we knew there would be plenty of places to hide. Josh and Shane would be doing the hiding while I would be the one seeking. Once we started, I gave them a head start of 20 seconds to go pick a good hiding spot. As soon as I yell out the all too familiar, ready or not, here I come, I instantly began looking around the basement, searching every room and even closets. However, I wasn't able to find them. For whatever reason, I turned to my left towards the dark boiler room and turned on my flashlight from my phone to light my way. The boiler room light was broken, which my dad had yet to fix, even though we never used the boiler room. Upon entering, I noticed a blue tarp covering something in the back of the room. The outline appeared to be a person, and that's when I knew I had finally found someone. I ever so slowly approach the tarp and remove it, expecting to see Shane or Josh hiding there. But instead, I was greeted to a dirty-looking man I had never seen before holding one of my dad's power drills. It took my mind a few seconds to process as to what I was seeing before running out of the room screaming. I then look back and see the man slowly get up and begin to follow me. Thankfully, however, I had slammed and locked the boiler room door shut so he wouldn't get out. Looking back, that was probably the smartest move I've ever done in a situation like that. This caused both my friends to come out of their hiding spots and ask me what was wrong. When I told them that there was a man hiding in the boiler room, they somewhat believed me as I was already distraught. That's when we all decide to book it upstairs and wake up my parents who were still asleep. My dad was clearly in a grumpy mood, but after I explained myself, he stormed down to the basement like a madman. I guess he must have found the guy as we heard a bunch of commotion going on in the boiler room. The fight was over within a short period of time due to my dad delivering several blows to the man's face. My dad had rushed my mom to call 911 while my dad had tied him up. My dad is ex-military, so he was not the type to allow anyone to pose a potential threat to our family. It took a little while before police got to my house, but they ended up arresting him. As the police were questioning him, he admitted to simply walking into my house through an unlocked door. The reason for this was because he just needed a warm place from the freezing cold. Whether his story was valid or not, 
I couldn't help but feel sympathy for him. Winter is the time of year where a lot of squatters seek shelter for warmth, and I'm still shocked that my house was targeted. He had also admitted that he had done this to several other homes, but had got away before he was caught. My dad had called all of my friend's parents to come and pick them up, as he was already uncomfortable as it is. I didn't get much sleep for a week after that, and it was only after I had stayed with my grandma for a few days did I slowly begin to get over it. It wasn't until a few years after, where my dad and I were watching a movie about a home invasion. I'm not sure what the movie was called, but it reminded me of the incident to which I brought it up to him. My dad sighed and said he had purposely left out an important detail that day. Apparently, as he had opened the door to the boiler room, the man had been standing there and had attempted to use the drill to harm him, and this resulted in my dad throwing punches at him. The reason he never told me this was because I was too young and that he didn't want to scare me more. It was then when I had realized that if I had opened the door again, he probably would have tried to kill me. I was a small 13-year-old boy, so there was no way I could have taken him on, especially with a power drill. The last I heard, he was taken to a mental hospital after being released from prison. While this all was a terrifying situation, I just hope he's getting the help he needs. For starters, I'm a 29-year-old female and currently live in upstate New Jersey with my fiancé, Brian. We had just bought a nice, one-storied home in the suburbs after finally moving out of my parents' house. The house wasn't anything too fancy, just your typical American-style house appropriate for a couple like us. This happened during the winter of 2021, when the pandemic was still in effect. My fiancé and I had gotten jobs as software engineers and would constantly work long hours into the day. On this particular day, I had been off from work, so I took this time to just have a nice day to myself. It was mid-December, and the news had reported heavy snowfall in the area, which made for a perfect setting. At some point during the day, I had decided to take our dog Crayon out for a walk along the trails by the park. We never really took him outside all that much, so I decided to give him some freedom. Crayon is a fox-faced Pomeranian, the perfect comfort dog for any household. By this point, it was snowing pretty hard, and I wanted to make the walk quick so him nor me would get too cold. New Jersey during the dead of winter was beyond freezing, and you only went out when you really had to. That, or you simply loved freezing your ass off. In this case, I was out for both reasons, and I grew up in the cold, so I was used to it to say the least. As I'm walking him by the tree line, he stops in the snow and perks his ears up, facing the direction by some dense brush. In a playful tone, I ask him, Do you smell something, boy? Assuming he saw a small critter, like a lizard or something. That's when he begins to get nervous and starts barking at something in the woods. However, his barks weren't the annoying slash normal barks. These seemed more out of control, as if he had felt threatened by something. I turned to the woods, staring into the thicket, but I couldn't see or hear anything except for the sound of wind and snow falling. At this point, Crayon is going absolutely insane running in circles, screaming, and even pissing himself. It was almost as if something had been attacking him and that he was trying to get away. This was clearly an indication that there was something or someone watching us that he could see but I couldn't. That's when I begin to feel this negative energy and I pick up Crayon and run back to the house. I thought for sure that there was definitely something back there and that whatever it was, was going to follow me. I tried to run in the snow, even though the blankets of the snow had slowed me down. Needless to say, we get back, and Crayon seemed to have calmed down, but was on full alert. 
All the while, my mind is trying to process as to what the hell just happened and why he went so berserk. I didn't bother telling my fiancé about it or anyone else, fearing they'd think I'm crazy. But would you blame them? We've walked him out on that trail several times and nothing close to this has ever happened. The worst thing that's happened while walking him was him nearly getting into a fight with another dog. That's it. We still take Crayon out on some walks here and there, but I always remember to use a different path. As for my fiancé, I just tell him that Crayon gets nervous around there. I still have theories as to what really happened on that day, though there isn't much evidence to back it up. My most common theory was that there was someone hiding in the woods that I couldn't see which caused my dog to freak out. The other theory was that there was some sort of entity or energy in the woods which made my dog visibly anxious. Part of me wants to believe this theory, and the other part of me doesn't. Dogs can see things as humans can't, that I know for sure. It's just crazy to me that there are things in this world that we can't quite fully comprehend. Back in 2017, I worked as a delivery driver for Uber Eats to make some extra money on the side. It wasn't the best paying job, but it was something to help me get by my struggles as a growing adult. I was 25 years old, and I'm sure most of you know how life really sets in at that age. Anyway, I live in the suburbs of New York. Not the city, just the state, as I was never a city person, but lived near it. Throughout my life, I've always been more of a quiet person, which is why I really like the suburban areas. One night, I was doing some late night delivery orders to keep the income flowing when there had been an incoming weather report. The snow had been falling pretty hard and the winds were measuring well over 50 kilometers and that a blizzard was on its way. That being said, I still wanted to do a few more orders for the night. Luckily, I had received one order from someone on the other side of town. It wasn't too far, but this person barely met the delivery radius. I was annoyed because of the distance, but I realized it was another tip. I bit my lip and drove to the restaurant and to the given address. All the while, the falling snow began to come down fast and the winds were starting to pick up. On top of that, the snow on the sidewalks were already starting to pile up, so I knew I had to get there in time. I arrive at the destination, and there's this man standing outside of his terrace house wearing several layers of clothing. Just by looking at him, he did not seem like a pleasant type of man. It was one of those men that screamed stranger danger. He comes up to my car, and I proceed to hand him his food when he begins to ask for some money. I ask him what it was for, to which he then says that his car had been out of gas. Okay, so I wasn't sure why that was my problem, but being nice and not wanting to piss him off, I hand him a $10 bill and wished him luck. He looked down at the money and then looked back at me with a blank expression as if he wanted more. He then said that it wasn't enough and that it could at least do 50. I told him that was all I had but that maybe someone else could help him. The look on his face that day is something that will never leave me. It was a look of hatred and anger as if I were his sworn enemy. I then tell him to enjoy and drove off away from the building. Doing that, however, was probably the most stupidest decision of my life. I hear two loud bangs echo through the streets along with something hitting my back tire. It didn't take me long to realize that these bangs were actually gunshots. Suddenly my car swerves from left to right and the ice didn't make it any better. Eventually, I managed to get a hold of the wheel and drive back with my back tire making this awful noise. However, I was afraid of what might happen if I stopped my car in case he was following me somehow. Thankfully, I had gotten home safely just in time and didn't once look back. 
Police were called, and I reported the incident to Uber, but nothing ever became of it. After all, this did happen in the Bronx, which isn't the safest place in the city. I guess I learned my lesson not to assume that everything I do is safe, when in reality, it isn't. About five years ago, my mom started dating a guy that she'd met on a dating site. The online dating is fine. I had recently started dating a woman who would later become my wife, and we'd met online as well. Both my girlfriend, who would later become my wife, and myself never liked this guy. We thought he was a weirdo literally from day one. We didn't think he was mean or anything like that, just creepy. He was quiet. He kept his eyes closed a lot, occasionally saying odd things, like offering my wife a chocolate, then popping one in his mouth and closing his eyes, then moaning as he let it melt in his mouth. It was all stuff that just teetered on inappropriate, but also kind of reminded me of special needs individuals I personally known as well in my life. I don't mean that in a disparaging way in the slightest. Just in a sense that I wondered how much control this guy had over his thoughts and his words. One time my wife and I were visiting my mom, but she got called into work. So we waited at her house. Her boyfriend was over, and he spent the entire several hours that night just hanging out in her bedroom with the door closed. We could hear noises every now and again, but for the most part, it sounded like he was just lying totally still in there. Really creeped us out because we didn't know what to do. We ended up just waiting it out, but maybe be a little bit more of a host next time. Just before Christmas, my mom and this guy start having some difficulties. My wife and I were visiting for the holidays. She dropped all of her problems on us, and we listened carefully, gave our opinions, and suggested that she might be better off without him. She had already made her mind up, though, and decided to break up with him on Christmas Eve. I couldn't help but smile. Of course, she'd been lying out this entire plan, down to the day of when to do it and then explained it to us purely for confirmation. What I was smiling about was that she'd already lured us into the house for the holiday weekend. We're gonna be stuck in the crossfire after she dumps this guy. All I can imagine is him quietly collecting his belongings before murdering us in our sleep. Thanks, mom. We spent the night at my mom's and got up early on Christmas morning to visit my dad at his house. We didn't plan to spend the night at my dad's, but we got snowed in, which was actually a nice Christmas surprise. We had avoided the entire breakup conversation the night before and then got out of there pretty much the moment the sunrise and we were happy to be now stuck in my dad's. The next day we left as soon as we could to get through the snow. My wife suggested that we stop by my mom's house on the way, make sure that she was okay. My wife just had a really bad feeling about that ex-boyfriend. I couldn't blame her. That whole weekend was like a perfect murder setup. It was a holiday weekend, fresh blankets of snow, family members coming and going, adding to the chaos. With my mom and that guy snowed in alone, the reality became more clear that there was potentially danger at hand. My mom's car was in the driveway, but that doesn't really mean much. She lives close enough to work that she actually walks often. She never locks her door, which drives me crazy, so we let ourselves in. That's when we see blood oozing out of the refrigerator's water dispenser. It had filled up the spill container and was leaking onto the floor and made this giant puddle. My wife screamed and I freaked out. I fully expected to see my mom's head in the freezer. The house is caught in this eerie half light, no sound or movement. There doesn't seem to be anyone around. I holler both of their names into the house and get no response. A sour pit is churning in my stomach and I'm starting to really entertain the idea that the worst has happened. It's not hard to do when you're seeing exactly what you didn't want to see. I nervously opened the freezer to find a bag of frozen cherries that had been opened, crammed into the freezer so that it fell onto the ice dispenser and then melted. My mom turned out to be in the shower just warming up. Ex-boyfriend was nowhere to be found. We told her about the cherry incident, to which she gave us this funny look and asked us to show her. She claimed she never even bought frozen cherries, didn't have any. Those weren't hers. We think the ex-boyfriend bought them, opened them, and then arranged them in the freezer so they'd thaw and drip, like a weird, ominous power move. For Dayton, Ohio, Christmas time of 1992 would become synonymous with the group whose name would haunt the city for many, many years to come, the Downtown Posse. Since their meeting during a night of drinking just two weeks prior, 22-year-old Marvallis Keene and his 16-year-old girlfriend Laura Taylor had been inseparable. 
Laura had recently been kicked out of her parents' house. She had no job and had quickly become financially dependent on Marvalis, who had burned through what little cash she had keeping her entertained. Around two weeks before Christmas, the couple spent the last of their cash on a single night stay in a downtown Dayton hotel and were desperate for money. Fortunately, Laura had an idea. She knew a man named Joseph Wilkerson who had a rather lucrative job at General Motors, a man who spent a sizable amount of his disposable income on sexual deviancy. The plan was simple. Laura would call Joseph, invite him to an orgy in exchange for a sizable amount of cash. Once they knew he had the cash on hand, they could get into his home with the help of a fellow member, Heather Matthews, and rob him. But the raid turned into something far more horrific than a simple smash and grab. On Christmas Eve, once Marvalis, Heather, and Laura had forced their way into Joseph's home at 3321 Prescott Avenue, they tied him to a bed with electrical cord, torturing him until he gave up the cash. But once the money was secured, Marvalis used a 32 caliber Derringer to execute their victim so he couldn't report them to the police. After the murder, the trio made themselves at home, raiding Joseph's fridge and playing loud music before stealing his car which now facilitated their killing spree. What came next can only be described as a frenzy of violence. The next victim was Danita Gallette, who was shot multiple times while using a payphone at 517 Neal Avenue. There was no plan this time. It seemed like they just shot a totally random person in the middle of the street before jumping out of a stolen car and taking her shoes, jacket, and a backpack. After they were apprehended by the police, the surviving members of the downtown posse would admit that the sole motivation for Danita's cold-blooded murder was to steal her brand new sneakers. The third victim that night was a man named Jeffrey Wright, who was shot four times while standing outside of 157 Yuma Place. Thankfully, he was lucky enough to survive the attack, but as it turned out, Jeffrey had a personal connection to the group. He was the ex-boyfriend of Heather Matthews, who was, by that time, in a relationship with another downtown posse member, Demarcus Smith and it was he who pulled the trigger four times, hitting Jeffrey in both legs. Fortunately, he was able to escape to a neighbor's house and get himself some medical assistance. The downtown posse then rested for the night, but planned on resuming their spree the very next day. As the sun set on Christmas Day 1992, the group had decided on their next victim, a man named Richard Maddox, and he too had a connection to the posse. He was Laura Taylor's ex-boyfriend, who was lured from his parents' house with the promise of reconciliation. He picked her up in his car, and the pair then drove around discussing their past relationship. But unbeknownst to Richard, the rest of the downtown posse followed close behind. Richard soon figured out that he was being tailed. He grew nervous and attempted to make a quick getaway. And that's when Laura put the Derringer pistol to his head and pulled the trigger, killing him instantly. Then as the car was about to crash, Laura threw herself out of the moving vehicle and was then picked up by the fellow gang members. On the following day, Sarah Abraham was working at the family-owned shortstop mini market on West 5th Street when the posse entered the store. Once again, Laura Taylor seemed to be leading the group in selecting their victims, scouting ahead and entering the store first to ensure that they would not be overwhelmed or outnumbered. She was followed by Demarcus and Marvalis, who shot Sarah in the face before wounding a customer who was just picking up groceries. Sarah would survive for five days in the hospital, but eventually she would succumb to the complications stemming from those wounds. Immediately following that short stop shooting, the posse made their way to Salem Avenue, where they found a woman airing up her tires at a gas station. As soon as the woman saw them approaching with guns drawn, she fled. But it wasn't this that saved her life. It later came to light that Laura Taylor had demanded that Marvalis shoot her as soon as she ran, but he hesitated, and the woman was able to make her escape. It's a highly disturbing detail that the youngest and seemingly most innocent of the four was evidently the most bloodthirsty. The posse then stole the woman's black Dodge Shadow, the same car that was pulled over in a traffic stop that led to their arrest. In the aftermath of them being apprehended, the group told the police where to find two more bodies those of Wendy Cottrell and Marvin Washington. Their bodies were at the city-owned gravel dump, located at 1654 Richley Drive. These two were members of the posse that Laura Taylor ordered the execution of, 
because she believed they knew too much and would break under police pressure. They told the two soon-to-be victims they all wanted to party and told them to get in the car. A short while later, Marvalis pulled the car over into the gravel pit, ordered Wendy and Marvin to get out, and then he and DeMarcus shot them in cold blood. It's terrifying that the downtown posse quickly went from killing for financial gain to just killing for the thrill of it, and all during the most festive time of the year, when families the victims would have been extra devastated to learn their loved one's demise, given that Christmas is such a family-oriented holiday. Perhaps the only solace we can take in this case is to learn that Marvalis Keene was executed for his part in the murders, and the families of the victims managed to get some measure of justice. I never use these app much, but there is one time that really stands out. It just happened to be from a dating app. I match with this girl who's really pretty. She's plain and seems to want a simple night out. No tattoos, no urge to party, and doesn't seem to be into drugs. All signs point to a nice, quiet night out. We agree to meet up for dinner and test the waters of conversation. It was your average Americana restaurant. A place I only went to once and probably went out of business later that summer. We take a booth in the back. This girl slides in next to me without any hesitation. Alright, kind of strange, but not the weirdest thing ever. We're having a little small talk. Getting each other's names right when I feel her fingers creep into the palm of my hand. For some reason, I like pretend I didn't notice. I mean, surely she's not trying to hold my hand 30 seconds after meeting me. As the waitress comes back to take our drink order, her fingers slide in between mine for the classic hand interlock. This is really happening. It's not the weird part though. Throughout the entire meal, she never let go of my hand. Can you squeeze harder? She asked me. What? I replied. Come on, your hands are so big, mine are so little, can you squeeze them real hard? She went on and on. I obliged because I thought she was being cute. She giggled and wrung my wrist back and forth like we were on a walk or something and not in a packed restaurant. The waitress brought the meal back and still, this girl never let go. We did our best to eat with one hand, one utensil, while she continued to ask me to squeeze her hand harder and harder. Finally, I realized she wasn't being cute. She was just being seriously strange. I saw the other tables looking at us with confused looks and I realized my conundrum. You're so strong, you could really hurt someone, she explained to me. Squeeze until I say ow, she insisted. Huh? Was all I could say back. Squeeze harder. Squeeze until you hear my bones pop, she instructed me. Okay, now I was getting kind of creeped out. It's almost like she wanted me to hurt her. Finally, I pulled my hand out of her wiry little grip. What seemed like a for sure safe date turned out to be a total lunatic. I called for the tab while she pleaded for me not to go, and it was all a joke. I didn't understand. I paid the bill, walked out the front door, and never saw that lady again. I didn't even have to block her on the app because I deleted it immediately after. Sometimes, though, I can't help but wonder what she was looking for. More importantly, did she find it? I'm a very outgoing woman, but I'm larger than most men like, so I have a hard time making connections. That being said, I was on every dating website and app for at least five years. It was the easiest way to stay current in the dating scene without constantly striking out. Dating people you only know through the web leads to some weird encounters. One of these encounters happened when I accepted a date invite. It came from one of the shortest men I've ever seen. I have nothing against dating men that are shorter than me, but I get comfortable when they're too small because I'm 5'11 and overweight. This guy was 5'4 and maybe weighed 115 pounds. Despite the severe size gap, he seemed like a genuinely nice guy, had a lot in common with me, and even seemed to have his life together. Many guys and girls throughout online dating service don't have jobs or cars, a house, or income of any kind. So when you meet someone who has all of those things, you definitely try to keep the conversation going. Well, we go to grab drinks at a bar. He's nice. We're having a good time. But eventually, 
He starts making odd comments about my height and how strong I looked. I thought maybe he was just a little socially awkward, but hey, it didn't seem malicious. But he didn't stop. Every other word out of his mouth was a compliment regarding my size. It got more and more uncomfortable to the point I couldn't enjoy myself anymore. And in a weird backwards way, I understood what girls meant when they complained about being objectified. It's like you aren't a person at all. Toward the end of the day, he ends up telling me that he has a fetish around being picked up, lifted, and squeezed by larger women than him. He says there's nothing else that satisfies him, and it's been this way for many years. Oh. Okay, well, some people have their thing, and at least I could kind of see what he was attracted to me physically for. So I agree to a second date. Well, leading up to all of his messages, it started being about how he couldn't wait for me to lift him up in my big, strong arms, and how he wondered if I could lift him up over my head. Eventually, that was the only focus, and I'll admit I got weirded out and politely told him I was no longer interested in him. He took it surprisingly well for someone so forward. I was partly expecting the classic clingy, you're the only one for me kind of behavior. I judged him way too soon as he turned out to be somewhat of a classy guy, just a little shameless with his fetish. But that wasn't the weirdest. The worst? I matched with a guy on OkCupid, but we never actually got a chance to meet. There was never any mention of a date. We briefly talk, and then he kind of fell off by the wayside for a few months. One day, he reappears in my message requests, apologizes for being absent, and explains that he was on another date with an OkCupid member for quite a while. No worries, that's what the service is for. He explains further that he and the other girl have broken up, but are still talking from time to time. Okay, splendid. Where do I fall into all of this? Between the two of them, there was very little chemistry, but apparently the sex was really good. They wanted to know if I'd be interested in a threesome to help elevate their bedroom play. It was creepy, disparaging, and it got me off of dating services for quite some time. I had a happy ending though. My long-term partner and I met on OkCupid and I couldn't be happier. You just have to weed through the wrong ones and the weirdos until you find the right one to fit. I used to have a job that was adjacent to sex work. It was completely legal and it made me a decent wage and allowed for a lot of free time. Was it safe? Not really. Was it fun? Probably too much. I was at a strange point in my life where danger equated excitement. Now, since I was always having this casual fun through my line of work, I used a lot of dating apps to fill some of my time. I had it in my head, that work was work. These were guys that paid my bills, not anyone I'd ever consider getting involved with. I thought I'd just find a casual boyfriend through an app, not realizing this person probably wouldn't be cool with my lifestyle, just to put it plainly. I matched with the guy I was head over heels for. Without going into too much detail, he looked and talked like the guys I dreamt about. He was so tailored to my taste that I actually kept him a secret from my friends. I thought if I shared my discovery, it would tarnish it in some way, like one of my friends might steal him from underneath me before I could even meet him. In hindsight, maybe I thought it was too good to be true. It's what I call getting love bombed, the honeymoon phase. Two people seeing the most perfect versions of one another, long before anything can be spoiled by who they really are. I was getting love bombed bad. I wanted to talk to this guy at all hours, so it was starting to affect my job. Finally, we caved and just made plans. No wasted time in dinner or a bar, he gave me his address and I dropped by late one night after work. It was explosive from the start, literally from the moment we met at the door was raw and passionate. None of the sterile structure I had at work. Like I could really let go and to succumb to whatever I wanted to do with this guy. He changed as things got heavier though. He started talking to me in a way I really didn't like. He'd talked dirty to me since we first started chatting, but this was a step beyond. It was mean and degrading and honestly a little scary. I thought you liked this, he said. I didn't really know what to say. He started telling me about where I worked and what I did while I was on the clock. Suddenly, I understood that this was a setup by someone who knew me from the club. We were naked, interlocked in his bed with his hands around my throat, and in that moment, 
There was absolutely nothing I could do but give in and try and survive. I'm going to keep this part of the story brief, as it's a bad memory for me, horribly visceral, and a trigger for many others. The sex turned so violent that I was in and out of consciousness. The few people I've discussed it with just tell me that I passed out. When we're done, he insisted I spend the night. It was a traumatizing evening of waiting for the worst to happen. Would he beat me? Would he rape me again? I didn't know what to expect, but knew what could happen. It was scary and nauseating to be there at all. When I finally got out, I went straight to my coworkers, who were not very supportive. Half of them didn't even believe me. The other half assured me it was just a misunderstanding. A few of them even knew the guy I was talking about and promised me that he'd never do that. It was awful to escape that situation, only to find myself the villain on the outside. Next, I went to my real friends, people I knew outside my line of work. They knew what I did for a living and kind of blamed it on that, said I shouldn't have made myself available for situations like that. It was my first experience with a victim blaming in the early 2000s. That left me alone with my worst fears. I decided to go to the clinic and get tested. It was something I could do within my power that would yield pragmatic results. I didn't know what that guy did to me. Was I pregnant? That I now have an STD? Finding out would bring me at least a little bit of peace. I went and did the testing, then lingered in the waiting room for a few of the quicker results. It was quiet and kind of cozy in there, so I didn't hesitate to nest myself amongst the fuzzy chairs, old magazines, and ratty stuffed animals. I zoned out on my phone and took a little solace in being able to hide out for a minute. That didn't last very long, however. As I looked down at my phone screen, I saw some familiar text, something an acquaintance of mine shared. It was a screenshot photo of my Tinder profile, alongside one of the texts I had sent to a friend of mine. Somehow, the guy that abused me got a hold of those texts and made a meme out of the entire situation. I broke down right there in the lobby, silently wept to myself. There was nothing I could do, 100% out of moves. I got out of my career field not long after. The scariest part about the whole ordeal was how no one took me seriously because of my profession. I was pigeonholed in this weird, self-created hell, purely by my line of work. Don't ever let anyone tell you how things are just because of your lifestyle. All of my results came back negative. Aside from the emotional damage, nothing stuck. I fell off his radar after a few weeks and he moved on to another victim. Don't make the same mistakes that I did. Don't fall for the fake chivalry. Don't go out expecting others to pay. Don't go home with strangers. And above all else, don't trust dating apps. I used Tinder and other dating apps when I was younger and single. One day, I matched with a guy who was almost 10 years older than me, as I was only 21 at the time. Despite the age difference, which did kind of throw me off, we clicked really well. Many of our interests lined up, and even had some of the same concerts. Having so much in common with an older guy was a real confidence booster. He went on, and in just a week, he suggested we waste no time falling in love. He made it clear he wanted to sweep me off my feet, and there wasn't any sexual pressure or urgency at all. This was a genuinely nice guy who wanted to be sweet on someone. Later, he implied that we should move in together. He started making a checklist of our personal items, seeing what we had doubles of, and what we had none of. It was tedious and cute, and a great way to make small talk. It reminded me of the game Go Fish, except it was a dating version for adults. Lastly, he said that he would be happy to adopt my daughter. This was a huge thing for me at the time, being young, newly single, and even newer yet, made a mother. He described all the duties and roles he'd love to fill, which hit every mark for me. This was like a dream come true. Now, this was all expressed before we'd even met. This was just seven days of talking. Looking back, it's some of the most psychotic stuff I could imagine, but I was young, and courting weirdos on dating apps. Mr. Say-It-All didn't say a word in person. We met each other at a nice restaurant for an early dinner and just sulked for two hours. There's no other way to describe it. 
I tried speaking to him for a while, to which he would nod or shake his head or simply not even react. What he would do is stare at me for an eerie, uncomfortable amount of time. Deadpan, emotionless staring right into my eyes. If he moved his eyes to another feature of mine, he would deliver the same merciless stare until his eyes moved again. I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. We split the bill and I went home. We communicated through texting for another week as I struggled to let him know that I was no longer interested. He mentioned planning a second date, which forced me to finally come clean. We had a back and forth discussion for maybe an hour about essentially the same thing. We weren't going to talk or see each other anymore, to which he would say he didn't understand, and then continued his gushy smothering talk. Once I finally got through to him that we were over, he actually took it surprisingly well. He didn't beg or plead for another chance or ask me to meet one last time. I actually never heard from him ever again. Despite that silence, I've never forgotten that damn stare. People talk about boring their eyes out and this is what they must be talking about. Dark, beady, unblinking. I could feel my heart thumping to a roar the longer he looked at me. Sometimes I wonder what he was thinking while he sat there with that look on his face. The story takes place when dating apps were still kind of new to the social scene, mostly used for casual dating, parties, and hookups. I started using several of these apps probably due to the social pressure, plain curiosity, and also partly because I'd seen my friends have so much success. It just seemed like an innocent pastime for a single and promiscuous people. Like everyone back then, I heard the horror stories and urban legends about online dating. These went all the way back to the Craigslist days, so I was familiar with the potentially bad stuff that could happen. This created a slight paranoia for me, so I kept my own precautions in a place when dealing with anyone on these apps. I have a slight fear of men in general, so I really use these apps as a buffer between myself and possibly harmful people. One day, I matched with a guy and we picked up a conversation pretty much immediately. He was cute in all of his photos and really seemed to be clicking with me. So the exchange is heated to the point that we're hanging on each other's every single word. For someone like me, I perceived it as a genuinely passionate exchange. Not sexual or anything, but just two people excited to learn about one another. He asked for my phone number, to which I agreed. Texting was still somewhat new back then as well, so exchanging numbers solely for the purpose wasn't out of the ordinary. We sent only a few messages back and forth before he asked me for my Facebook and Tumblr account. This started to creep me out because I hadn't mentioned using these social medias. It was like he knew what websites I used. I know it's dumb, but sharing my personal accounts was one of my precautions back then. I know he already had my number, but having my social media accounts would mean he could identify me, things about me, where I live, and all that other stuff you don't want to think about. So I told him I wasn't comfortable sharing that information. He said that was okay because he's a spy. He already knew everything he wanted to know about me. I laughed and tried to joke with him, but he brushed it off like he wasn't kidding. I started getting knots in my stomach because this was getting weird and felt too close. I wished I wouldn't have given him my number so easily. We kept texting for a little while until he started casually mentioning personal information about me. My last name, the street I lived on, the school I went to as a child. It gives me chills to think about all of the random stuff he somehow learned about me. It's easy just to talk it up to him actually being a spy, but what are the chances of that? Zero, probably, so how did he even know? He went on at length about how he was so relieved that I wasn't catfishing him, that I was an honest girl, not giving him the runaround. I got defensive. I started calling him a creep, to which his only response was laughter in all the capital letters. As I said before, this was when texting and dating apps wasn't really as high tech, so you couldn't like text bomb people, and that's where you'd send the same text to someone's phone dozens, maybe even hundreds of times. He'd text bomb me with these ha-has every time he sent them. I know it doesn't sound like anything, but it was chilling to receive. I was upset and scared. All I could do was get laughed at. After a while, I just stopped responding. It didn't matter, as he just continued to blow my phone up for several more hours. After a week, 
I finally went to my service carrier's office and filed for them to have him block his number. It seemed to work, as I never heard from him again. It also proves he wasn't a secret spy or whatever he claimed to be. He was just a techie weirdo. The whole thing was very isolating and demeaning. Don't make a habit of handing out your phone number to people. This was years before dating apps were a thing, when we used various websites to try to match with essentially complete strangers. I was using Match.com, and very cautiously, I might add, as the whole concept was still new and I had some apprehensions about the possible dangers that were involved. I would log in once a week, just to feel like I was taking proactive steps to escape my lonely, single life, without actually doing a whole lot in the way of dating. I started talking to a guy that interested me, and in retrospect, my interest was from a purely physical standpoint. I thought he looked like Jeremy Piven in one of his profile pictures, a celebrity I'd been crushing on for a decade at that point in my life. Had he not looked like Piven, I'd have never been caught up messaging him and would have never gotten involved. When we met up, I knew things wouldn't go well. First of all, he looked nothing like my crush. He looked like the character from the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series. Skinny, poofy, receding hair, timid. He catfished me pretty hard and didn't seem interested in addressing it in the slightest. His first tactic was to drown me in alcohol. We met at a restaurant and started with a round of cocktails. He insisted on shots multiple times in between our first and second rounds, which practically came at the same time because we drank them so fast. There wasn't any bread or starter food, so my stomach was on its own with all this booze. He'd gotten me drunk before our entrees even hit the table. A pair of Manhattans came to the table just as we finished eating, another treat he insisted on. By now, we'd had six or seven drinks, way more than the amount I'm used to. It got to the point that I insisted that I needed to go home, which he obliged almost too happily. In fact, this later on, as you can imagine, turned out to be a huge mistake. Never ever let these kind of people know where you live. It will come back to bite you in the ass. He parked in front of my duplex, but kept the doors locked. He was assuming we'd have sex in the car before I stumbled my drunk ass inside. I was so plastered and in such a state of disbelief, all I could do was laugh. We were going to drunkenly get it on out on the street like a couple of high schoolers. Suddenly, I realized this guy was a legitimately a loser. The whole thing from start to finish was just a plot to get laid. Again, you have to remember, this is in the days of Match.com. I was one of the many women looking for love on the internet. I admit that my interest in this guy stemmed from what I perceived as his good looks. But using a dating service just to get laid was crazy to me. What a bizarre way of scoring a hookup, like tons and tons of extra work. He didn't get it and I had to lay it out flat that I was refusing to sleep with him in the back seat. So it's a no after all that? He asked. I'm sorry, was all I could say. No, you aren't. If you're sorry, let's just do it, he said. It was all pressure, but I continued to deny him. His face turned darker and darker until he finally gave in. Fine, be a bitch, he said. What? I asked. He continued to berate me the entire time I sat there. He picked every flaw from my features and didn't just examine it, but blew it up. He made me sound like the ugliest woman he'd ever seen. It didn't stop with the physicality, though. Nothing was safe. Everything I'd shared about myself on my profile and at dinner suddenly became the weapons used against me. To say he hurt my feelings is an understatement. He brought me to tears and looked happy when he did it. It was just starting, though. I woke up the next morning to flowers on my back porch, complete with an apology note, the signature from you know who. I was stunned. What a complete whack job to take me out, attack me in the driveway, then leave me a present like we had history together. I was numb at the thought of him skulking around the outside of my house, peering in the windows, waiting for me to wake up. This went on for two months. I'd wake up at least once a week and find a pile of apology gifts sitting outside my back door. I spoke to a few close friends and family members, 
and they all told me the same thing. Call the police. Now, don't wait. Don't reach out to this weirdo. Just simply file a police report and get on the right side of safety. The issue is that I was so humiliated from being catfished, I simply couldn't bring myself to do it. Going to anyone meant I'd have to explain how the hell I got involved with this asshole. Almost blackout drunk in the passenger seat of his wannabe sports car. So I got creative. I fished out my old Polaroid camera down from the closet shelf. Next, I took the 380 North American Guardian pistol from my bedside table and set it on my pillow. I centered the eyepiece and snapped a keeper for my stalker friend. On the bottom place card I wrote, I'll use this next time you come by. I slipped the Polaroid into an envelope and left it at the back porch. It took a couple of days, but sure enough, one morning it was gone, and he never came back after that. Years later, I actually ran into that guy again, at a restaurant just down the road from where he took me. He was alone, balding, generally looked like hell. I was with my new husband, who had heard several stories about this guy. My husband stared him down until he actually paid his tab and left the bar altogether. When I was 19 years old, I still lived at home with my parents and little brother. They were going out of town for some weekend getaway trip, but I was at the angsty stage where I only wanted to do my own thing even if that meant foregoing a legitimate good time. The truth was that I was incredibly hungover. I was early on in my drinking career and had a long night of boozing the night before. I felt so sick that all I wanted to do was lay down and just be alone. I definitely didn't have the stomach to be with my family for 72 hours straight. I coughed up some excuse and they left me behind. You might ask yourself what I had planned for this epic little weekend. No house parties, no spin the bottle, no drugs or music. The first thing I did was cut all my hair. This was around the time Britney Spears shaved her head. It was on every news station in America. I low-key thought it was kind of badass to just go against what everyone thought about you. I was getting ready to ship off to college at the time, so the notion of a self-reinvention was very exciting. Chopping off my hair seemed to be the quickest, most convenient route of rebellion. After the impromptu haircut, I went to the bathroom for a mini spa afternoon. Face masks, moisturizers, and I even cranked up the shower to make it all steamy. After an hour of lounging in the bathroom and getting all the hair cleaned up, I stepped out into the hallway naked as the day I was born. Moving naked through the house is a prized pastime for many homebodies and I was no exception. I went into the kitchen to find a snack and just kind of zoned out as I looked out the window. I glance down to the bag I'm eating out of and I see a note on the counter. That's weird, I think. I don't remember my parents leaving me a note. At first glance, I recognize right away that it's not any handwriting I know. It reads, I was going to leave you a letter, but I see that you're still here. My blood runs cold. Still here. Who the hell wrote this? I can feel the water dripping down my back, reminding me of just how vulnerable I am. It's the middle of the day, and still, I'm worse off than a sitting duck. There's a creak down the hallway. I make the split decision and barrel towards my bedroom. Can't do anything without clothes. I'd rather get murdered than run onto the street naked. There's someone standing there, though. I enter the room and find a man. Tall, dark clothing, with greasy hair hanging in his face. The moment I step into the room, he cracks this broad smile, and it's the creepiest thing I've ever seen. The only thing I can do is scream bloody murder right at the top of my lungs. His smile fades and he takes a step towards me, almost apologetically. That's when I recognize him. This weird guy that I dated my freshman year. We were an item for about three weeks before he ran away from home, and I mean ran away. No one saw or heard from him for months. The actual local myth was that he'd been found one city over and was homeschooled now. Regardless, here he stood, grinning in my bedroom. He reached behind himself, grabbed my clothes off the bed, and then hands them to me. I proceeded to dress myself in the most awkward situation I can possibly imagine. He didn't even act like he was doing anything wrong, which was creepy, but also a comfort, kind of like a little kid or something. 
He makes me sit down on the bed after I get dressed. Honestly, he didn't do anything weird or violent. He didn't threaten or hurt me, other than breaking into my house. He heard I was moving away and wanted to see me before I left. He said he'd been thinking about the past a lot, and that freshman year was his favorite. We didn't date long, but it held a special memory for him. We talked for a couple of hours, and then he left. I never saw him again, but I did hear a couple of years later that he was fully institutionalized for schizophrenia. That definitely added up when everything was said and done, but made me feel a little uneasy after the fact. How long was he in my house without me knowing that day? And worse than that, could he have possibly hurt me? Lock your doors when you decide to stay home alone. I live in a small country where things still go bump in the night, and that doesn't go for just creepy local legends. Dark strangers, cartels, I think you get the idea. Where I live, nowhere is truly removed from the day-to-day -day dangers of the unknown. It was a dark night. I found myself home alone. Here, it isn't uncommon for the entire family to live together. Grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren will all share a growing piece of property for wealth and security. It's the simplest way to live. But as you can imagine, being home alone is a rarity. With so many people under one roof, it's almost impossible to time anything just right to ever be actually alone. So I did what I always do. I hooked up the surround sound throughout the living room and turned out all the lights. I bundled up on the couch with my favorite snack and watched whatever I desired on the big family television. Despite the ever-present danger I mentioned earlier, I remember the evening being quite relaxing. Rain and a breeze moved in along the coast and created a pitter-patter against the roof. As the night went on, I thought I heard someone at the front door. As I moved to investigate, the sound and movement stopped. But being a stormy night, and that I had the sound up so loud, I truly in my heart believed I'd simply heard something that wasn't there. I turned back to the movie and did my best to relax. That's when the back door began to rattle. I adjust myself on the sofa to get a better look. When someone starts to knock, a frantic, heavy banging against the hardwood. I froze in place. Whatever I dismissed as storm sounds or... Maybe just the junk blowing around in the backyard is now undeniable. There's someone trying to come inside the house. Everyone who lives there naturally has a key. Whoever is outside the door clearly does not. At the time, I'm an 18-year-old man. I'm running through the logical scenarios in my head. Whoever this is, they tried to open up the front door then slip around the side of the house and is now trying to force the back door open. This isn't cartel or a monster. Anything with real bloodlust would have forced the front door open. I reason that it's a common thief, probably someone very nervous and trying to remain unseen. Being 18, I decide to take them head on and show the world this asshole picked the wrong house. I move from the couch to the kitchen, grab the biggest cleaver I can find. 10 inches of dingy, ugly steel. Still, the door handle is twisting back and forth. Go time. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm down for whatever. There's nothing like the mentality of a teenager. You don't know who you're messing with, I shouted through the door. The stranger on the other side stopped shaking the handle for a moment. I know you're out there. You have three seconds to get the f out of here, or I'll cut you up. They didn't care. The knocking started again, even harder than before. My confidence quickly faded. I took a deep breath and readied myself. In my head, this was do or die. Hoisting the cleaver over my head, I unfastened the bolt and threw open the door before me. It wasn't a burglar or a gangster of any kind. It was my sweet little grandma. She stood there soaking wet with an expression of agitation, but also unmistakable terror. What are you doing? She shouted at me. Me? What are you doing at the back door? I asked. I thought you were an intruder. No, oh, no, no. She laughed as she stepped inside the house. I went and paused the television while she shed her coats by the door. She explained that she'd gotten home during the storm, tried knocking for a while. That was the noise I heard at the front door. I guess she knocked for quite a while because she finally gave up and decided to try the back door. 
The front entrance has a little cover, so she figured that even if it were locked, at least she would be out of the rain. That's when I started to hear the commotion and decided to go to war with whatever was outside. Glad I didn't though, because I seriously almost killed my grandma. I played softball throughout high school. This meant I got home an hour or two later than school actually let out. Regardless, I was still the first one home more often than not. My parents worked well into the afternoon, and my sister participated in various clubs and after-school events like theater club. I got home one day to the usual scene. Fully locked house. Lights are off. Note from my mom in the kitchen. I let my dog out in the backyard, changed out of my uniform, and opened up a bag of Cheetos. Very average, very typical day. My dog scratched to let me know he was bored and to let him inside. Dog and I cuddle on the couch and start watching our favorite shows. Out of nowhere, I hear a door slam open. It's beneath me, downstairs in the basement. I could feel it vibrate through the floorboards. I know this sounds weird, but this wasn't out of the ordinary. The basement was like a downstairs apartment. And my older sister lived down there. The basement had its own entry door to the outside, and she could be pretty careless with her coming and going. Our parents had spoken to her multiple times about letting the door slam open and closed. So honestly, I didn't think twice about it. I kept watching TV and eating my Cheetos. My dog, however, got up and moseyed down the stairs. Again, this wasn't odd, but what was odd was the silence that followed. A smooching or petting, no excited cheers. The dog went downstairs and that was that. Still, I continued watching TV. Maybe she was just in a bad mood down there. After a few minutes, I see movement in the front yard. I turn to find my dog, the one that was just with me on the couch, running up and down the block. He's a big, dumb, and overly friendly Labrador who is not allowed out front. My sister definitely knows this, so I'm thinking, what the hell is she doing? I get off the couch and go down to the basement stairwell. The lights are off. It's eerily quiet. I'm starting to feel all the things that are out of place, the peculiar things that I should have noticed earlier. I reach the basement landing and see the door wide open to the outside world. There's mud tracked in a few steps, and a boot print placed squarely in the center of the door. As I near, I could tell somebody kicked that ground level door in for whatever reason. Robbery, rape, murder, the list really only gets worse. Once they heard the television upstairs and the dog coming down to check the bottom floor, they must have gone back out the way they came and left the door wide open. I told everyone what happened when they got home. They searched the house and the property, but nothing turned up. So my parents got a security system a few weeks later. That was the only reason I ever felt safe inside that house ever again. I live in a pretty rural area outside of your average middle America town. It was my night off and I decided to just hang around the house myself. I got some things done around the yard, did a little self care, and then settled in with dinner and a movie for the evening. I like to be low energy every now and again, but still I have the tendencies of a night owl. The movie turned into a TV show and soon it was well past midnight. I hunkered down with my phone and a blanket and let the night really begin. Just as I'm zoning out, Someone starts pounding on my front door. Not a knock, but a full force blow against the wood. I freeze for a moment, but then I make the easy assumption it's my boyfriend coming over for a spontaneous booty call. This was common behavior for him and one of the reasons I did like staying up late. I barely had to stand up from the couch to be able to see through the small glass window in the front door. Now, I really do freeze. My heart is the only thing I can feel in motion steadily slamming up my throat. Staring back at me through the pain was not my boyfriend, but an older, bearded stranger. It was the most unfamiliar face I'd ever seen. This little window in the door was weird because if you were up close and trying to look through it, the prismatic glass skewed the optics, made it impossible to know what you were looking at. You had to have some distance between yourself and the window, like I had right now to make out what was actually on the other side. This guy was looking at me, but I knew he couldn't actually see me. I snuck back down the hallway and hid in the doorway of my bedroom. I was scared. 
but I would have been way more scared if I didn't have an eye on him. I couldn't imagine how I'd feel if I turned my back for one second and lost track of him. Remember when I said I live rural? Well, I also live in a cellular dead zone. I didn't even bother to find the damn thing. Instead, I stepped to my bedside and fished the landline from my end table. I hit the dial button and brung the receiver to my ear. It's completely dead in my hand. The guy hammers on the door, this time screaming at the top of his lungs. Let me in! He slurs. My blood runs cold. This is now worse than a horror movie. I start running through what few options are available to me. No phone. No way to get to the car. No one coming to get me. I have to stay inside where it's safe. That's the only thing that makes sense. First, I sneak into the kitchen. Slide the chef knife out of the block. It's the only weapon in the whole house. Next, I slink into the bathroom across from my bedroom and lock the door. It's just a weak little handle lock, but it's enough to buy me some time if he actually breaks through the front door. For some reason, the idea of keeping the high ground was pulsing through my mind. It was literally all I could think about, for I barricaded myself in the bathroom. So, I climbed up onto the countertop and crouched above the door. If he broke in, I'd be able to jump on his back and stab him in the neck and shoulders. I was terrified of the whole thing, but I do have to admit, I was very pleased with my whole little assault strategy. In my head, it made the most sense. With a knife in hand, all I had to do was sink at home. Time went by. A guy just keeps yelling. Hey, let me in. Now he was moving around the house. I could hear his hand dragging along the siding as he walked from end to end. He checked each and every window, yanking on the frame, pushing on the glass. Thankfully, I kept them all locked as well as both doors. I could hear his frustration, and he took to wailing on the walls again, demanding I let him inside. Something occurred to me. That handset I fished out from my bedside table was dead. This psycho didn't cut the line. I just didn't charge the phone. There was a second one down the hall in the kitchen. Nervously, I climbed down from my perch on the countertop and waited until I heard the guy on the opposite side of the house. I unlocked the door and bolted for the phone, which was exactly where I thought it'd be, sitting in the cradle by the back door. I snagged it and retreated back to the bathroom. I called 911, and they dispatched a few officers, but were totally transparent when they told me it'd take at least 15 minutes for them to get there. I was on my own and needed to stay frosty until they arrived. I stayed on the line until the cops arrived. They could hear the guy pulling and kicking at the doors screaming for me to open it. The longest 15 minutes of my life. When they arrived, they apprehended the man immediately. Dispatch confirmed that I could exit the house, where I stepped out to find a whole team of cops standing around one dirty, scruffy, drunk-off-his-ass hippie-looking kid. He was cuffed, sitting on the ground, totally confused about the situation. He clearly wasn't a murderer. There was a party down the road. This kid stumbled off to take a piss or something, got lost in the dark, and thought my house was the spot. He convinced himself that everyone had locked the doors and was hiding somewhere. It turned out to be a big misunderstanding, but still, it was absolutely terrifying. To this day, nothing compares to what I felt that night. Remember to keep your phones charged and at the ready. Years ago, I moved into an older apartment. It was pretty cheap, and the building only had eight units in it. There were four on the ground floor and four up above it, all of them opening up to the outside. It was really all that I could afford, or else there's no way that I would have moved in there. The rent was like $400 a month, and in that location was really cheap. The apartment that I had was on the ground level and at the far end. It had one bedroom, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. After moving in, I didn't have a problem with filling up the space with the furniture that I had, and I didn't even have that much stuff. For the first two or three days, things went fine. I was gone for most of the day at work and back by nighttime. One night, I went to bed at about 10 o'clock, only to be woken up in the middle of the night. Somebody was knocking on my front door. I looked at the clock, and it was midnight. I sat up and turned on the light from my bedroom. 
Why would anybody be knocking on my door at midnight? I got up out of bed and then walked out into the living room and turned the light on. I could sort of see that there was somebody at the door, but just saw their silhouette. When the light turned on though, they turned and walked away. I didn't get a good look at them at all. I went over to the door and looked out of it, but by now they were gone and I didn't see anything. It was kind of weird, but I decided just to go back to bed. I was able to get back to sleep and I'm not aware of the person coming back that night. I didn't wake up for the rest of the night. The next day was normal. I got up, went to work, and then came back home. That night, I fell asleep at the usual time of around 10 p.m. But once more, for the second night in a row, I was woken up in the night. This time, though, I wasn't sure what woke me. I didn't hear anybody knocking on the front door or anything. I turned over to go back to sleep, but I really wasn't that tired. I was wide awake, and I had a bad feeling for some reason. I sat up and turned on my bedroom light. Everything seemed fine to me. I decided to get up and go to the bathroom and then try to fall back asleep. So I got up from my bed and walked over to my bedroom door. The door was closed and I opened it to my living room and kitchen area. The living room was closest to me and the kitchen was at the other end. The only light was coming from my bedroom, so it was kind of hard to see anything, but everything appeared to be normal. When I stepped out though, I heard a noise. It was coming from my kitchen and behind the counter in an area that was not visible to me. I stopped where I was and looked over to the counter. Now my heart started beating really fast. I had no idea what that could have been. I said, is anybody there? It was dead silent. I didn't hear any noise at all. I had no idea what to do in this situation. It sure seemed like somebody was in there, but I still was not 100% convinced. My eyes were just locked on the counter area where I had heard the noise. Then, a few seconds later, suddenly somebody appeared. They stood up from behind the counter and immediately started running towards my front door. It was probably like 15 feet away from them. It was still very dark and I couldn't see them very well, but I was sure that it was my landlord. He made it to the door, opened it up, and then ran out of my apartment. I really couldn't believe it. I ran over to the door and then locked it, then went into my bedroom and called the police. I told them that my landlord was in my apartment in the middle of the night without permission. They came out and talked to me and said that they were going to talk to the landlord next. I went back to bed and the next day got more information. The landlord admitted to being in my apartment. He also apparently was involved in other illegal activity. As a result, all of us tenants of his building had to move out and the building went to new ownership. I'm not sure of all the details. All I know is that I had to scramble to find a new place. It was for the best though because I would much rather live in an apartment without the landlord entering as he chooses. This is something that happened when I was a kid, about 13 years old. I lived with my parents and two older siblings, both sisters. I remember that my father got a new job and we had to move like an hour away. For me, it was exciting, but also kind of sad to leave our old neighborhood, especially at that age. Our new house I thought was pretty nice. It was in a neighborhood with lots of other houses but we had a decent sized front and backyard. We were not rich, but it had two floors and a basement. All four of the bedrooms were upstairs and the main floor had a kitchen, dining room, living room, and family room. There were also a couple of bathrooms and closets. We moved in one day with the help of a moving company and then spent the next couple of days unpacking boxes and stuff. By the following week, we were all moved in and it was summertime, so luckily I didn't have school. One night during that same week, I stayed up late playing video games. This is something that I did a lot during that time. Everybody else had gone up to bed and I was by myself on the main floor and in the family room. I really don't remember exactly what time it was, but probably after midnight is what I would guess. As I was sitting on the floor and playing video games looking at the TV screen, I saw something behind it. We had a window which faced the side of our house behind this particular TV. I saw somebody walk past outside, right by the window. I couldn't tell who it was at all, but it really took me by surprise. At first, I was wondering if I really just saw what I thought I did. Our house wasn't that close to the neighbors on that side that it would be the neighbor. I had a bad feeling about it. It seemed as though whoever it was was headed into our backyard. I decided to get up and go look out of one of the back windows inside. I carefully went towards the kitchen, which was at the back end of the house. When I did, at first, I didn't see anything. I got up close to the window and looked out into the backyard. 
Everything seemed normal though. It was pretty dark in the backyard, but I could see most of it. I was wondering who the person was and where they had gone, but I was also glad that I didn't see them back there. After looking out the window for probably like a minute or two, I backed away. Then I headed back into the family room where I was before playing video games. Around the time that I made it back into the room though, I heard a rattling coming from the back door. Somebody was trying to open the back door leading from the backyard to the kitchen. Instantly when I heard it, I sprinted up the stairs. Then I ran all the way to my parents' bedroom. I woke them up and told them that somebody was trying to get in the house. My parents both came downstairs with me. When my dad turned on the light to the backyard, he saw the man running away. I didn't go over there, but I guess the man was by the house near the other back window and no longer at the back door. He ran out of the yard and through another neighbor's backyard before going out of sight. After the guy ran away, my parents stayed up for a bit, but the guy didn't come back. My dad went outside and saw some marks on the back door. I think the man was trying to get in. I went to bed a short time later and the guy never returned. For the rest of the time that we lived there, no more strange things like that happened either. I still wonder who the guy was and why he tried entering our house. For months, I was afraid that somebody else would try to break in. Luckily, nobody did though. Being an addict during the holidays can be a surreal experience, and that's putting it lightly. My first Christmas as a junkie was actually pretty awesome if you can believe it. I was still a weekend warrior back then, limiting my doses to stave off physical addiction, and whenever I felt myself getting a little too into it, I'd wean myself off with Suboxone and then start all over again. But then, as time went by, the small amount I used to do wasn't enough, so just a little got to be more and more. Slowly but surely, it took over my hobbies, work, then eventually family, until the only important thing in the world was making sure that I had enough not to get dope sick. I managed to stay functioning for about a year, and by that I mean I managed to hold down a job, keep up with relationships, and otherwise refrain from being a total screw-up. But after a bad breakup with the one girl that was holding me together, I gave up on any kind of dream or aspiration I had and settled on taking H for the rest of my life instead. I guess that sounds like a pretty crappy decision when I lay it out like that, but that's essentially what I did. I told myself it was all just temporary, that my so-called hero's journey would end in me kicking H after a few months on my butt and that it would all end up being a crazy story that I told my drinking buddies one day. Well, a few months turned into six years of lost time, and like I said, the first few holiday seasons weren't so bad. But once I stopped talking to my parents and moved up to Portland, that's when things started getting rough. For a start, a junkie in the Pacific Northwest, the year split into two halves. As the old Ella Fitzgerald song goes, summertime and the living is easy. And that's for all the obvious reasons you can imagine. Nice weather, good dope after the dry season harvest down in Mexico, and everyone's relatively chilled out. But then in winter, all you got is dope from the wet season harvest, which is weak crap that barely gets you high. Then on top of that, when it gets real icy or the snow is too thick, getting your hands on enough dope to see you through the day gets tougher and tougher. Then eventually around Christmas, Pretty much everyone who isn't a degenerate junkie takes a 24 to 48 hour break to sing Feliz Navidad, see their families and eat their turkey or whatever. An experienced junkie knows to stock up before then, meaning people are boosting and selling like crazy in an anticipation of their dealers turning their cell phones off for the day. So in the run up to Christmas, I've been squirreling away cash like crazy and on the 23rd, me and my girl managed to score 15 grams of crappy dope that'd be enough to see us through this next week or so, without having to go out into the ice and snow to score more. We scored in the early afternoon, went back to my apartment, did enough to stop getting sick, then I went off to work for a few hours. My girl had a job working as a waitress and started her shift like an hour or two after I did, so it was normal that I'd come home to an empty apartment. So I finished my shift, one of the guys from work gives me a ride back home and I got these tingles of exhilaration knowing I'm about to spend an hour or two in a warm bath with a few bumps of H to keep me company. I walk into my apartment, flop down onto the couch, 
then reached under it to pull out the little wooden box that we'd kept our dope in, and I sat it down on the coffee table, flipped it open, but instead of the five little baggies that should have been staring at me, there was nothing. At the time, I figured there had to be some kind of mistake. I had all these wishful thoughts, like maybe my girl had stashed the dope elsewhere after she saw the cops hanging around our apartment building or something, or maybe she poured all the dope into one of the bigger baggies that we had. You'd honestly be amazed at how much people will pay for baggies when they really, really need them, so maybe she'd sold or swapped the smaller ones, then just forgotten to put the dope back in the box. It sounds really pathetic looking back on it, but it took me a really depressing long amount of time to realize that there wasn't some innocent explanation for 300 bucks worth of dope going missing. My girl wasn't my girl anymore, and on her way out, she'd stolen almost everything of value that she could carry. Again, sounds pretty pathetic, but I think that was one of the single worst moments of my life right there. My immediate reaction was, well, bad, but with addiction comes a certain pragmatism. Every moment I wasted freaking out that the love of my life had betrayed me for a few bags of dope was one that I wasn't spending trying to recoup my losses. So I got to work. I walked for miles, literally miles, making almost constant phone calls to a bunch of different people. Now don't get it twisted, I was still trying to call my girl, but she continued ducking my calls and in the end, it didn't make sense to jam up my line with calls to her voicemail, even if it did mean that I could leave her some threatening voicemails. I'm not proud of it, but it is what it is. Anyway, I call around every dealer I know and everyone is either out of stuff or is finishing up for the night and not answering their phones. All out of options, I started calling around everyone I know that uses and all I can get my hands on is enough dope to last me the night. I walk over to the place, get the stuff, and walk all the way back to my apartment, I'm still trying to get a hookup the whole way. When I get back, I wait until I'm feeling gross, then I fix, go to bed, and wake up bright and early the next day to start all over again. The next day, pretty much the same thing happened, only without the goddamn disaster at the start of it. I walked all over town, almost constantly on the phone, but all I could find was enough to fix me for that night and that night alone. Everywhere I went, I was asking if anyone had seen my girl, and when everyone said no, every single time, I had this overwhelming sensation that they were lying to me. I guess it was partly paranoia, but partly based in fact too, because she couldn't have just disappeared on her own like that. Someone knew where she was, and who she'd run off with. But even if they knew, they'd never tell me. No one wanted to have the blood on their hands, and given the headspace that I was in at the time, I honestly couldn't tell you what I'd have done if I'd gotten my hands on my thieving ex-girlfriend. Anyway, like I said, I did a lot of walking, and only managed to get a hold of about a half a gram, so despite having enough to keep me from going into withdrawals on Christmas Eve, I knew Christmas Day was going to be rough as all hell. But still, the poetry of it wasn't lost on me cold turkey on Christmas Day. No better day for it, right? The weird thing, though, is when you're on heroin or any kind of powerful opiate, it kind of makes you chemically incapable of caring. Ever wonder why street junkies seem to have zero shame when it comes to begging or shoplifting? We just don't care. At least after those first few times, if you're deep enough into it, it becomes just another thing. So, I knew I was screwed but it wasn't going to hit me until I started to get sick, and when it did, it hit me all at once. Around 8.30 on Christmas morning, I started calling everyone I knew who used again. This was the third day in a row, so people were only naturally starting to get sick of hearing from me. Everyone was either out or didn't have a single hit to spare me, and the more desperate I got, the more I turned to sketchier and sketchier sources. These were people who, for one reason or another, I'd learned not to associate or do business with, and in the case of one of them, I literally had him saved in my contacts as Sketchy Kevin. I worked my way through Sketchy Kevin, another guy I'd call Pissy Pete, and then finally a guy named Rat Tail, named so because he wore his hair in a rat tail like 10 years ago after it got lame to do so. He also partly earned the nickname due to being a complete and utter scumbag, but by noon on Christmas Day, I was relying on that scumbag to score me some dope. 
Rat Tail said that he'd see what he could do, and would call me back if anything came up. About an hour later, he did, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear. Rat Tail said that there was a dude named George, who would just straight up give me a couple of grams, but he just needed a favor. Right away, I thought that that was weird, because who the hell just gives away dope? But Rat Tail said that he wasn't a junkie, and he needed someone who didn't mind getting their hands dirty. I didn't like the sound of that, nor did I have any idea what Rat Tail meant, but I was also in no position to turn the offer down, so off I went after getting a hold of George's address. The last place I expected to end up that day was a nice-looking three-story right on the edge of where the city meets the suburbs. It was way too nice of a place to have any heroin inside, but then again, appearances can be deceptive. I walked up the driveway, knocked on the door, and some totally normal-looking, well-to-do dentist-looking dude welcomes me inside like I'm some late dinner guest that he'd been expecting. It was to the point where, despite this dude expecting me, I sort of didn't believe that he had the dope to just give away, and I started thinking that he was like a cop or something. I don't know how that had worked out, but I honestly couldn't mentally handle the setup, so I just started asking questions. Where's this dude's family? Did he actually have the dope? Could I see it, and could I fix before I did whatever he wanted me to do? The guy had no problem showing me the dope, and he had no problem if I used a little if it helped me get the job done. I was so desperate by then that whatever it was didn't matter. All that mattered was the dope. I took the baggie he gave me, went up to the bathroom and did my thing. All I did was smoke and snort, never got into needles, always hated them, so it was a relatively quick process of snorting some and then seeing what the deal was with the task that he wanted. And during that, George leads me onto the third floor of the house and into what he said was the guest bedroom. And there, lying on the bed, was the body. The kid looked to be about high school age, and he was just laying on their back, wide-eyed, with all this dried puke around his mouth. I'll never forget what George said to me when I gave him this look of horror. He was 18, I swear. The poor kid's age was the very last thing on my mind in that moment. I had a ton of other questions, and George seemed more than happy to fill me in without me asking. I, I don't know what happened. One minute we were... You know, then the next he... And that was all he said. Well, aside from the very last thing, which was, I need him gone. I'd rather not go into what happened next. I'm not proud of it, and to be perfectly honest, it's extremely incriminating. I don't imagine George was really George, and I don't know how in the hell he knew a guy like Rattail, but the only thing that keeps my conscience clean is thinking that at least he didn't kill him. If it was just a tragic accident that happened, I don't know, somehow, then all I did was help clean it up. At least that's what I told myself at the time. And now I'm not so capable of lying to myself that easily. I don't know if the poor kid was ever found, but if he was, it was never linked back to me. Maybe that George character, but never directly to me. And so, that's the story of the worst Christmas I ever had where I hid a dead body for some varnished old psycho just to get enough heroin to see me through the holidays. Worst thing is, I didn't even quit for like another year. Not truly, that is. But that was definitely the event that made me realize that I truly hit rock bottom. Getting clean was rough too, especially rough. I wanted so badly to put things right, but not only was I so high at the time that I'm not sure I could remember exactly where I put all the pieces but I was far too cowardly to face up to all the terrible things I'd done during my years as a junkie. I guess this works as a sort of confession too, but I think it reads much better as a warning, and not even specifically regarding heroin either. No matter what you do in life, don't ever sell your soul for anything. And by that I mean nothing is worth selling your conscience or your innocence for, because they're not things that you can never get back once they're gone. And my second warning is that ghosts are very, very real. They're not real in the sense that you might expect, but if you do something terrible enough to someone innocent enough, you can bet your bottom dollar they'll haunt you for the rest of your life. 
just like that poor naked teenager with puke around his mouth still haunts me every single Christmas. I'm an elementary school teacher. Winter break just started. I'm feeling super joyful. But before break, some of the kids were talking about their presents and Santa. It got me thinking about when I stopped believing in Santa, which is the story that I'm going to share with you all because when it comes to finding out about Santa Claus and that he isn't real, I had a pretty uniquely terrifying experience. I loved Christmas. I mean, I still do. But as a child, I absolutely could not sleep on Christmas Eve. I tried to spy Santa a million times. I'd wait for my parents to go to bed, try to sneak out. They'd catch me every single time. Except one year. I was in second grade, so probably like six or seven years old. I recall my best friend at school saying something like pretend to be asleep. Then my parents will go to sleep faster, so sneaking out to meet Santa would be easier. Perfect. So Christmas Eve shows up. I'm riddled with angst, and I remember my friend's advice pretend to be asleep and that's what I did before Christmas story was even over I started to act sleepy I don't know how great my acting skills were but it was good enough to where my dad said he should just take me up to bed I obliged and allowed myself to be carried when my dad left the room I think I waited just a few moments before getting out of bed and sitting next to the door I was listening for all the key indicators that the house was sleeping what I remember most is how long it took forever. I actually dozed off, and when I woke up, the house noises had subsided. I figured my parents had been in their room for long enough, and decided now I'm going to make my move. Opening my door with such grace, I slid out of the doorway and started my way up to the living room, a combo of tiptoeing and sliding, until eventually I reached our couch. I dove into the couch, lifted the curtains, and then sat wrapped up in a blanket peering out the window for Santa. It was snowing, and I could have sworn that I heard sleigh bells, but I wasn't seeing anyone. I had a gut-wrenching thought. Maybe he had already come. I squirmed out of the blanket and curtains, looked at the tree and stockings, and whew, he hadn't arrived yet. As I maneuvered back under the curtains, I'm shocked. I see the man himself, Santa, He's walking, though. No sleigh and no reindeer. But I'm not picky. It's Santa. I realize he's going to pass right by my house. But he's looking all over the place. At all the houses and all the windows. What's he looking for? I think to myself. Then he stops in his tracks. Gives another look around at all the houses before his eyes land on me. He sees me. I'm ecstatic. I start waving excitedly, trying so hard not to squeal. He waves back, and then looks around before he starts walking toward my window. As he approaches, I notice that he's got a bag with him, and I assume it's full of presents. He mouths or whispers the phrase, Do you want to come say hi to Santa, sweetie? I shake my head yes. He points to the front door. I leave the window and walk over to the door where there's another long window that reached the floor. I watch as Santa tries to open up the door, but it's locked. I reach for the lock, unlocking the door, and he tries again. From the other side of the door, I hear him say, Okay, sweetie, you just gotta unlock that other lock, the one on the doorknob. So I try to do what he's telling me, but for some reason I can't quite grip the lock. My little fingers keep slipping. Santa then tells me, it's okay, just go to the back door. Brilliant. I scoot over to the back door, and I wait for Santa. He rounds the corner, and the light from the back deck turns on. Santa is fully illuminated. And I remember thinking, wow, Santa is a lot younger than I thought he was. Skinnier, too. The lights seemed to scare him. He almost ran away until he saw me standing there. Then he proceeded to hustle towards the door, he was telling me and motioning me that I need to be quick. He said they had something special for me, but he had to then go. He leaned down and was reaching for something inside his bag. I unlocked the sliding glass door. 
I push my hands against the glass and start to push the door by walking my body in the direction I needed to open it. I'll note that even today, this door is hard to open or close if it's at the wrong angle, but at six or seven, it's nearly impossible. Just as he turned around, I heard the door start to give way, and as soon as it had, the home was filled with this awful sound of alarms. I took my hands away from the door and plugged my ears, and I looked at Santa. He now looked panicked. I noticed he was now holding some sort of rope in one hand and a bag in the other. He drops the bag and reaches for the sliding door. He slides it open no problem. He then reaches for me. But before I can reach back or move or do anything, I'm swept up by my mother. My dad kicks Santa square in the chest, knocking him back several feet, landing him on his backside. That's all I saw before my mom rushed me back to their bedroom and locked the door. My mom tells me that I didn't even cry at that point, which makes sense. I don't remember crying or even being terribly upset. Not until later, it was when my parents explained that the man who came to our house wasn't Santa. My dad kept saying things like, she still thinks he's real, of course she tried to let the guy in. Then I did start crying. That was all while the police were there. What happened to the guy? Ah, he got away-ish. The guy took off once he gained footing, and my dad didn't bother chasing him because he'd gotten the guy's wallet. The cops were on the phone and the guy left his bag behind. That bag wasn't filled with presents. My dad told me that it was filled with more rope like the kind the man had been holding. There was duct tape, candy, miscellaneous tools like a hammer, a lot of plastic bags and random clothes. Yeah horrifying but luckily he was picked up just a few minutes after he left our house pretty hard not to spot the guy running around town dressed up like santa claus in the end i did forgive my parents for ruining the magic that is believing in santa because you know they did save my life normally i don't go out christmas shopping on black friday I know there's deals to be gotten, but the actual amount of people who get them is pretty low. It sometimes seems that more negativity comes out of it more than anything else. I did go out on Black Friday once, and honestly, the experience kept me from ever even considering doing it ever again. This was a few years back. The big Christmas gift that year was a game called Uno Attack. It was supposed to sell out pretty quickly. My nephew really wanted one. So I decided for the first time ever to brave the Black Friday crowd and see about getting one. I waited outside the store in line for it to open. The entire time, I kept wondering why people were so fanatical about this. It was cold, and although I was reasonably bundled up, it didn't help that I had to spend so much time not moving. In addition, people were in terrible spirits, which seems to take the spirit away from the event itself. Some people would try to cut in line, which only made people already in line crabbier than they were. When the store was getting closer to opening, I noticed that there was someone from the store headed out and talking to each person in line. When they got to me, I realized that he was handing out tickets, indicating who would be able to buy Uno Attack. He asked me if that was why I was there, and I told him yes. He told me I'm lucky, because I was getting the very last ticket. Of course, this caused some groaning and swearing from people behind me. Although I hated the idea that there would be a lot of children who wouldn't be getting the toy they wanted, I personally was elated. That was until this guy got out of line and walked up to me. He came up immediately after that worker left. He first offered to buy the ticket from me. I told him no, because it wasn't a matter of money. It was me trying to make my nephew happy. He then started telling me that his son really wanted that toy. I countered, letting him know that my nephew also really wanted that toy. When I kept refusing, he started telling me other stories, such as his son was really sick, but I could tell he was just doing his best to make me feel guilty. From further back in the line, a few other people began telling the guy to leave me alone. He got into a shouting match with several of them. Eventually, the guy stomped away, but not before telling me that I'll get that toy. I tried to not think about it. I went in, claimed the Uno game, and did some more shopping. I figured that since I'd spent so much time outside, I should try to get as much done as I could. 
When I was done in the store, I went back out to my car. I put all the toys in the trunk and then walked over to the bookstore and the strip mall in order to get some other items. When I began walking back to the car a second time, I paused when I noticed the man from earlier was leaning on my car now. I began feeling tense, knowing this guy was going to confront me again. He was much bigger than I, but I decided I couldn't let him intimidate me. As I got closer to my car, he noticed and smiled. He reached into his pocket and I assumed he was reaching for his wallet, but it only took a moment before I saw that it was a pocket knife and he flipped it open. I immediately stopped. I couldn't imagine this guy would be stupid enough to try and threaten or stab me in a busy parking lot, but I also didn't want to test that theory. I quickly turned around and ran back into the store that I bought that Uno game in. I let the store security know what happened and they quickly gave me an escort out to my car. The man was gone but I was still shaken. I was more shaken when I noticed the knife marks on the lock from my trunk and now my trunk was also dented. There were also deep scratches in my driver's side window. For obvious reasons, I never went out Black Friday shopping again. The event in question happened during my sophomore year in college, back in 2012. I honestly can't remember the exact month, but I believe it was sometime during the winter. At the time I lived with two roommates, Katie and Danielle, and we were the best buds of all time. We had just moved into our first off-campus house, and we were reveling in the freedom of being out of the dorms. With this turn of events came some experimentation with drugs and alcohol. The three of us began hanging out and partying with a group of people who eventually got into harder drugs, like cocaine and molly, etc. Katie and I decided after a while that all of this partying was jeopardizing our health and our schoolwork, so we backed off on the drugs. Danielle, however, decided to continue experimenting and became more aggressive. I should note that I hold no judgment toward drug use whatsoever, but I include it because I believe it may be a crucial component of the events that followed. The saga started on a weekend. We all decided to go to a party one night and got separated from each other. I had made arrangements to leave the party early, so Danielle agreed to walk with Caddy back to the house. We were always adamant about the buddy system at night, however on that night, it failed. Danielle left the party with someone, leaving Katie to walk home by herself. She was unfortunately followed by a strange man. To this day, I deeply regret leaving that night. But I've come to terms with my past decision. I came home the next morning. Katie filled me in on the previous night. She was very upset, which was out of character for her. She told me that she had texted Danielle at some point during the night telling her that she was very bummed out about having to walk home alone. Katie was frustrated, and her text was blunt, but Caddy and I just figured that Danielle would either brush it off or apologize, and things would move on. That did not happen. Danielle flipped her shit, and became completely enraged. She responded very defensively, and told Katie, in very colorful terms, to basically fuck off and get over it. We thought it was pretty odd and hostile, but trying to just carry on with our lives and not overthink it. It was a Monday, so Kitty left the house to go to work on campus, and I went to my afternoon lecture. Sometime while I was in class, Danielle came into Katie's workplace in the student rec center and began screaming at her in front of 60 plus patrons, calling her all kinds of obscenities. She was escorted out of the building by security and somehow made her way back to our house. I should also note that Danielle's mother was visiting this week and was with her the entire time. I believe she was terrified of her daughter, which is why she never intervened. By the time she arrived at home, I had returned from class and was making food in the kitchen. At this juncture, Danielle's rage was centered on Katie, not me. I tried to let the two of them work it out without my intervention, but Danielle cornered me in the kitchen 
and told me how angry she was with Katie. I have never seen rage in someone's eyes like that. I refused to engage with her and retreated to my room in the back of the house. I sat on my bed and took some deep breaths. That's when I heard Katie coming up the side yard. She was crying on the phone with her mom, telling her what had just taken place at work. I immediately felt this horrible pit in my stomach, as I knew they were about to confront each other again. The door opened, and Katie walked in. I was still in my room when I heard them start yelling at each other. Katie stood up for herself, telling Danielle that she was way out of line, and Danny retorted with more obscenities. The yelling turned into full-on screaming, and I had finally had enough. So I went into the living room where they were arguing. Danielle's mom was there as well. I told Danny to knock it off and leave, to which she told me to go f myself. This gave Katie time to try to bolt into her room, but Danny followed her and slammed Katie's hand in the door as she was trying to barricade herself. Things had gotten way out of hand. I went outside on our front porch, and Katie followed me outside. A few seconds later, we heard Danny's mom screaming for her to put something down. We looked at each other in terror. I told Katie to run away and to call 911. At that moment, Danny flings open the front door, holding a giant kitchen knife raised above her head and screaming at the top of her lungs at Katie, saying that she was going to kill her. By this time, all of our neighbors were standing outside, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. I'm not a very confrontational person, but like hell was I going to let someone kill my best friend? So in a split second decision, I lunged at Danny and somehow managed to get the knife away from her and threw it on the front lawn. I ran to grab it, at which time Daniel had gone back inside to grab another knife. This time, she turned it on herself and asked me if I wanted to watch her end it all. Something had gone terribly wrong with Danielle. Her mother was hysterical by this point, and I kept pleading for her to stop. I then blacked out. When I came to, I was running down the street with Katie. We soon took refuge at our neighbor's house. All the while, we could still hear Danielle's blood-curdling screams down the street. We were totally shell-shocked but grateful to our neighbors for helping us out until the police came. We saw the cops show up a short time later, along with a crisis unit. They detained Danny and drove her to the hospital, where she was put on a psychiatric evaluation. Katie and I never saw Danielle again, and we stayed with some mutual friends for a couple of weeks before returning to that house. We moved out at the end of that year, as the place harbored too many bad memories for us. I later learned that Danielle had experienced a psychotic break triggered by a variety of factors, including stress, drug use, and an underlying mental health condition. This was a huge eye-opener for me to further educate myself about mental health in young adults, as well as appreciate the incredible things your body can do while you're in fight-or-flight mode. It's also taught me a lesson to trust my gut more, as my spotty senses had warned me about Danielle before, but I ignored it. This is somewhat of a convoluted story, so please bear with me as I try to convey everything that I can recall about what led me to the conclusion that my former housemate could have potentially been a serial killer, or one in the making. It was the summer of 2015 when I moved in, and at first appearances my housemate Mike was somewhat normal, if not a bit socially awkward and dysfunctional. When I was signing the papers, he was adamant that I should never go into the basement, which I thought was odd. But I really needed a place to stay, and everyone has their little quirks, so I just chalked it up to that at the time. As I got to know Mike more, I learned about the depths of his dysfunction. Firstly, 
he used meth. Now, I don't automatically judge people based on vices, but I was surprised at the extent of his use. He is probably the first person I knew who used meth and balanced a full-time job and enjoyed a decent amount of success. The reason this is important to the story is that when he would be around the house, drinking and using, he would start to run off at the mouth, joking that if I smelled a lie coming from the basement, to not think anything of it. It was probably the third time he said this that I asked him why he kept saying that. He responds with, I use chemicals to clean up after the bodies, with a creepy grin on his face. I tried to chalk it up to a bad sense of humor, but it didn't sit right with me. He was also very particular that I let him know about my coming and going and my work schedule. I remember him being shocked and uncomfortable one day that I ended up taking off of work because he didn't realize that I was home. I remember that day because there was a lot of clanging and what sounded like muffled shouting coming from the basement. His car was in the driveway, but he was not in the main house or his bedroom. On other days, he would play very loud music that bumped through the entire house. Sometimes he would even play NPR talk radio at very high volumes. In retrospect, I think he may have been trying to mask sounds. He would make remarks about sex workers, saying, You can do whatever you want. You can choke them or beat them to death and nobody cares. I took exception to this telling him that I thought that was messed up. When he would get to tweaking, he would always come back around to alluding to the same kind of violence, talking about he was a normal guy who owned a house and had a good career, so the police would never suspect him. At this point, I think he has gone too far to simply be joking. I was in a weird position. Money was tight at the time and I didn't have very many options. I tried to convince myself that even if he was messed up, he probably was just engaging in some outward fantasism. I knew that he would acquire the services of sex workers on occasion, but again, I don't judge that kind of activity at face value, but I was becoming concerned. One day when I was doing laundry, I caught a whiff of decomposition the house we were in was in southeast Portland and was relatively new. Having grown up in upstate New York, I know that animals can sometimes be trapped in the walls and die. But this was in the garage. There were no animals scurrying about. This was both strange and telling to me. I considered carefully what to do and decided that I would confront him about the smell. I decided to poise the question in a somewhat suggestive way by expanding on his jokes. I told him that he needs to do a better job of cleaning up the bodies because I could smell the decomposition from the garage. I will never forget his reaction. His eyes widened and he shot me a sharp glare somewhere between fear and anger. He stumbled over his words and eventually responded with, What? Really? Yeah, really. There was a few seconds of awkward silence before he said, Thanks for letting me know. He then promptly went to his bedroom and closed the door. A few days after that, he went into the upper crawl space in the garage while I was doing laundry. He called for me, and was trying to convince me to come up to the crawl space. My body locked up. My instincts were screaming at me that if I went up there, I would not come back down. I gave him some excuse about having to go somewhere, packed up my laundry, threw it in my room, and quickly left. He spent a lot of time in the padlocked basement without a doorknob. The only way inside was through the backyard. I wish I would have gone down there in retrospect to either confirm or dismiss my suspicions once and for all. In the last couple of months of living there, I was subjected to more graphic comments about women and sex workers 
explicit talk of sexual violence, and he was also using more and more. He once showed me a video he made, which featured heavy bondage themes interspersed with sounds of distorted screaming, and this strange, leering figure in a plague doctor costume. It was one of those situations where any one of those things by themselves may be innocuous, but as they accumulated together, they became a disturbing piece of art. It was October of 2016 that I finally left there. Taking off to a Native American reservation for a pipeline protest, there were mixed feelings of a call to action and wanting to get out of that house any way I could. I gave him notice that I was leaving. My last night there, he was drinking and tweaking again and eventually started in on the same conversation, loosely describing murder and sexual violence in the tone of some sort of edgy joke. You know they're going to catch you eventually, I said, not holding back my suspicion anymore. He reiterated that he was the last person that the police would ever suspect and asserted that they would never catch him. He said this in a very serious and concise way dropping the pretense altogether. I left the next morning. This haunted me for months, then a year, then a year and a half. It felt as though I hadn't done anything and the guilt was eating away at me. So I called the Portland Crime Stoppers and put in an anonymous tip. When I did, the operator started going back and forth, putting me on hold because the phone call had piqued the interest of the police sergeant who was assigned to the call center. So they were asking me detailed questions about his vehicle, the house, the methods he described, etc. It seemed like they had taken an interest. I gave them as much information as I could and left it at that, feeling just a bit better that I at least tried to do something about it. Fast forward to recent times, I told my mother all about this, and she became very interested, asking what house this was, and she ended up pulling it up on Google Maps and put it up on Street View. I noticed that there was a large enclosed trailer sitting in the driveway that wasn't there before. I could provide a few theories as to why it might be there, but cannot put together a practical reason for it. Admittedly, this is pure conjecture, but I can't help but wonder. I doubt that I will ever get closure or have my suspicions validated unless he finally gets caught and arrested. I have interacted with many sketchy and unsavory people in my life, but none of them have ever left this kind of impression on me. Make of this what you will, but I hope I never see him again. This happened over the course of a year, when I was between 15 and 16. I am 20 years old now, and it's only been recently revealed to me just how messed up the situation really was. I was obviously still living at home at the time, but my sister, who was 7 years older than me, had moved out and was living with her now husband, his high school best friend, and some other guy who they met through one of those find a roommate sites. He was kind of the reclusive, nerdy type, who preferred hiding in his room watching Star Trek and playing computer games, rather than hanging out with the other roommates. And the only person he ever really seemed to want to be around was his similarly shy and nerdy girlfriend. For a bit of context to the story, when this happened he was 28 and she was 24. They were both a bit weird, but initially seemed entirely harmless. For the sake of the story, I'll refer to the normal roommate as Frank, the strange roommate as William, and his equally strange girlfriend as Amber. Now, my sister and I have never really had the best relationship with our parents, and at this point things were especially rocky. Our mother was dating a guy who was, to put it kindly, an abusive sack of shit who seemingly hated me and would find any excuse to go off on me. As a result, I spent a lot of time over at my sister's place. It was around this time that William and Amber 
started to get very strange. As I mentioned earlier, the two of them were always kind of odd. They only ever seemed to want to talk to each other, and would even go as far as to ignore anyone else who tried to speak to them. Amber was far worse than William in this regard. He would at least give you brief responses most of the time. Amber had a creepy habit of just blankly staring at you for a couple of seconds, then walking away if you asked her a question or tried to engage in conversation at all. That wasn't the strangest thing, though. When I would stay over, I would sleep on a futon in Frank's office, which was on the ground floor. It happened to be next to the downstairs bathroom, which for some reason, Amber preferred using to the one upstairs. She would take long showers in the middle of the night, which was whatever. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper, so I generally slept right through them. One night, however, I stayed up super late doing some revisions to my homework. I happened to be awake when she finished one of her late showers. I was too absorbed in my task to really pay attention to anything else. But I definitely noted hearing the shower shut off because it was an indicator of how late it really was. Approximately 10 minutes later, I look up from my laptop and there she was. I always kept the door open just a crack because that room tended to get unbearably hot if I didn't. Amber was just standing there, outside the room, completely naked, watching me through the open crack in the door. I said her name and asked if she was okay, which seemingly startled her, because she then walked away pretty quickly. I convinced myself that in my over-caffeinated, sleep-deprived state, I just imagined the whole thing, and I didn't mention it to anyone. Fast forward around a month later, I head over to my sister's place one night to find Frank a bit agitated about what he perceives to be a peeping Tom problem. He found fingerprints on the outside of his office window in such a way that it implied someone had been pressing up against the glass and looking in. The blinds in this room were slightly too small for the window, so you could see in from the outside and the room was in the front of the house, with the window easily accessible from the street. He was concerned that some random passing pervert had been spying on him while he was having a private moment in his office, or some potential burglar had been sizing up the joint. The police were called, but since he didn't have any external CCTV at this point, no evidence could be provided, and ultimately, nothing could be done. Soon after, Frank installed both internal and external cameras on the house. This was installed while William and his girlfriend were away on holiday, and I guess everyone had forgotten to tell them about it. A couple of months later, I went to my sister's to find that William's room was empty and was informed that he had moved out. Of course, I asked why, and I was told that he and Amber were a pair of fucking creeps and the others had collectively decided to kick them out. Apparently, Amber watching me through the office door was not a one-time incident. The security footage revealed that she did this frequently, sometimes for as long as 20 to 30 minutes. I was just usually asleep when she was doing it. Not only that, but the fingerprints on the window had apparently been from William standing outside watching me after I had showered and was hanging out in just a towel, which was a less regular occurrence, but apparently was caught on camera enough times for it to be concerning. As if this wasn't creepy enough, I was recently hanging out with my sister and her husband. He made a comment about how he wished they would have told me the entire story at the time, so that I could have pressed charges. I asked him what he meant by that, and he explained that not only had they been secretly watching me, but the footage also showed they had messed with food and stuff that I brought over, depicting William licking all of my apples and Amber spitting into my orange juice, even dumping regular cow's milk into my lactose-free stuff, which explains why I had a period of feeling sick out of nowhere. Apparently, when Frank barged into their room to confront them about it, he not only found several shirts I thought I had misplaced were stolen by them, but they literally hung them up on the wall, along with several drawings of me sleeping 
and poems about me whose contents I don't know and really don't want to know. After seeing this, Frank gave them an ultimatum. You have two hours to get the f*** out of this house and never contact any of us again or I'm calling the police. They took the former option, but I still feel sick thinking of what they were potentially planning for me. I hate dogs. Please don't be mad at me when I tell you that. I'm not some psycho who thinks dogs don't have souls or they're evil, I actually used to love dogs. I was so excited when I moved in with my buddy who had four of them so you could imagine I was a little disappointed when he told me not to interact with them. He said that they were only tame around him and his girlfriend and if anyone else came near them they'd quote unquote freak out. It was a little scary to think about four very large dogs who hated me living only a wall away but my friend was usually pretty good about locking his door when he left or putting them out in the backyard if he was going to be gone longer than a day or so. One summer, my roommate said he and his girlfriend were going to visit his family a couple of states away and that he'd be leaving the dogs in the backyard for a few nights. He had automatic feeders and the dogs had access to this weird pedo-activated watering system so there was no need for me to go out and give them anything. The backyard was pretty huge and he assured me that they'd be fine and out of my way all weekend. I felt safe knowing that they'd be out of the house. No one was able to control those dogs except my roommate, so keeping them away from all the people while he was gone was definitely the right move. The day came where my roommate and his girlfriend left. I woke up and went downstairs for some coffee and looked out the sliding glass door at the four dogs as they stood there staring at me. Now these were all huge German shepherds, so seeing them growl at me but not being able to do anything about it kind of made me laugh a little bit. I went through my regular morning routine and got ready for work. I left the rest of the day and came home around 6pm after going to the gym. As I entered the kitchen I noticed something was very wrong. There was glass all over the kitchen floor and the sliding glass door was shattered. And that's when I started to hear the growling coming from behind me. I didn't even have to turn around to figure out what the sound was coming from. I did what any smart person would do and ran as fast as I could up the stairs into my room. The whole time I was running it felt like that dog was going to latch onto my leg at any moment. I slammed the door shut behind me and grabbed at my pocket to get my phone out and call 911. Except it wasn't there. The pocket was empty. I wanted to cry when I realized that I'd left my phone in my car in my gym bag. I felt so stupid. And you're probably wondering why I didn't just call for help outside the window. Well, I would have if we didn't live a mile from the next house. My roommate insisted on living in the country so his dogs could have a big yard to run around. I was really regretting moving in as I sat there wondering what the hell I was going to do to get myself out of that situation. I didn't even know where the other dogs were. I had only seen one when I made my way upstairs and I guess I could have overlooked them in the panic. Maybe the others were chasing me too. I leaned against the door and sat there for a few seconds before bang. Something huge and heavy was smashing itself against the door. Growling came soon after and I quickly realized the dogs were actually trying to get into my room. I didn't know if they were rabid or something, but I couldn't just sit there and wait for them to get to me. With the progress they were making on the door, I knew that they'd get to me at some point. The banging didn't last long before the scratching started. It was even louder than the banging and would quickly grant them access into the room if they continued to tear at that door. It was clearly very flimsy. I ran into the connecting bathroom and closed the door behind me. Listening to them scratch and gnaw their way through my door was mental torture. Getting ripped apart by dogs was not the way I wanted to leave this world. There isn't a single moment in my life where I wished I had access to a landline until that moment just then. I heard the door finally giving way and the dogs finally enter my room as they growled and barked. It was the kind of growl where even without seeing it you could tell that their teeth were showing. I still couldn't tell how many dogs were out there, I just knew that it was more than one. I tried my hardest not to move or make a sound, but the sweat on my hands made a squeaking sound when they slid across the floor as I tried to get up. My heart dropped and I knew I was screwed. They started their assault on my bathroom door and I had no choice but to get into my bathroom counter and climb through the very small rectangular window about three feet above the sink. I squeezed myself through and laid on the roof out of sight of the dogs in case they got into the bathroom as well. 
Hours went by before they got in. I felt safe though. This was the moment I realized that I had an injury on my left calf. The adrenaline must have worn off because the pain was getting worse by the second. I pulled up the leg of my pants and revealed a pretty severe bite along the back of my leg. And I kept wondering how long I didn't notice when that happened, but there was no changing anything then. Thankfully, the bleeding had mostly stopped, but I still wrapped it up with the flannel that I was wearing. I didn't need it exposed to whatever was on that roof. It was obviously the only choice I had was to wait on the roof for my roommate to get home a couple of days from then. I couldn't jump down because the dogs would get me. If I did jump down, I wouldn't be able to drive away because my car keys were downstairs in the house and I wasn't going to risk going inside again. I was safe on the roof and that was all that mattered. I didn't have food but thankfully there was a spigot only a few feet from where I was sitting. It was a considerably large house and the spigot was installed to easily hose off the roof if needed. I never knew what that was necessary for but I of course was grateful to have access to water for the next couple of days that I guess I would be spending on that roof. The hunger wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. The worst part was hearing the dogs make their way through the house at night looking for me and thank god they never found me though. My friend came back Monday morning and was shocked to find me on the roof. He gathered his dogs in his bedroom and helped me back into the house. When he found out what happened, he begged me not to tell the police or animal control. But I had no choice. One of his dogs had bitten me and they were so vicious that if they ever got out, I had no doubt that they probably would kill somebody. I went to the hospital and was treated for the bite wound and I was advised to get the rabies shot treatments and wasn't too happy about that, but it was smart so I went along with it. The dogs were impounded and after evaluation it was ruled that they would be humanely euthanized. My roommate blamed me for having his dogs killed, but I can't say I regret their outcome. I feel like lives may have been saved by them being euthanized. I try not to blame the dogs since I've known so many amazing shepherds in my life, but I do have this trauma. It turns out the sliding glass door had been broken in by a tree, pushed down by the strong winds earlier in the day after I'd left for work. Most large dogs scare me now and I can say that I don't particularly like dogs in general anymore because of this incident. It's disappointing, but oh well. I got my two cats and that's perfect for me for the time being. Hopefully one day I can find the love for dogs I once had. I think the real moral of the story is to not move in with a guy who is open about having aggressive dogs. Before we begin, I want to let everyone know that this is a true story. Not a single detail has been fabricated. During my first year of middle school... I developed a bit of a reputation as a wild child, and I've had several run-ins with our school's resource officer. One day when I was at home watching TV in the living room with my sister, someone rang the doorbell. This startled my younger sister because our parents weren't home. I was the oldest of four children, and despite my rebellious nature, I was still the big sister. I wasn't too worried about someone at our door because I figured it was probably the mailman or one of those annoying solicitors or perhaps it was our neighbor checking in on us. I went to the door and politely asked, Who is it? Open up. It's the police. A man's voice responded. By the way, our door had no peephole. That's a whole other story. But I could tell there was something off about this man's voice. It seemed cold and detached. I turned to my sister. I don't know if this guy's really a cop. Go upstairs and go check on Jason and Ashley. I'll handle this. She darted up the stairs. The guy on the other side of the door began asking for somebody by name, claiming that they lived there. I think you got the wrong place. No one by that name lives here. Well, I have a warrant that says otherwise. Are you lying to me, young lady? No. The guy that you're looking for doesn't live here. Then who just ran up the stairs? This immediately creeped me out. There was a long window by the front door. It had one of those thick frost layerings. It wasn't easy to tell who was inside if you were on the outside looking through it. But it didn't look like he was standing in front of the window. So when did he take a look? 
He would have had to focus real hard to see my sister because there were no lights on. Furthermore, it was midday, so it should have looked completely dark from where he was. I automatically felt threatened. Whoever this man was had crossed into creep territory. So now I was going to be a jerk. It was my sister, and she's obviously not the grown man that you're looking for. Why did she run? Because you're a f***ing weirdo. <laughs> Excuse me, you don't talk to a police officer like that. The way he said that sounded like he was becoming annoyed, like I should just trust him on his word alone. Well, if you are a cop, you're not a very good one, because you're at the wrong address. And how do I even know that you are a cop? You should just open the door and see for yourself. That's when I saw my sister peeking around the corner at the top of the steps. Get back, I whispered. We rarely get people at our door when my parents aren't home, but it's not impossible. I had this habit of locking the screen door. It was very strong for a screen door as well. And to clarify, it was one of those screen doors directly outside of the front door. Our front porch was open. I figured I would take the risk and open the door, just to see if this man was really a cop. When I opened up, the man on the porch did look like a cop. His hand was on his gun, and he kept looking behind me as if he was searching for something. His behavior made me trust him even less. He began grilling me about my sister, trying to catch me in a lie. Okay, so who really ran up those stairs? It was my sister. I already told you. How do I know it's your sister and not the person I'm looking for? Look, you have the wrong address. The man glared at me through his aviators. It was hard to see his face because of how big they were. It was like he was trying to hide his face. I know it's a silly thought for a kid, but my mom and I watched tons of true crime shows together. I know it was stupid to open the door, but I had this sinking feeling that he knew that we were alone. Up to this point, he did not ask for my parents, not even once. I just wanted to keep him in sight because I knew my parents would be home soon. The cop explained to me that the man he was looking for lived at our house, and according to his paperwork, this was still his current address. I informed the cop that we had been living here for a few years now, and I knew for a fact the woman before us lived here alone. This frustrated him, and he informed me in a demanding tone that he was going to check the house himself. Um, no you're not. Young lady, you're interfering with police business. Now open up the door before you get in trouble. I'm not stupid. I know that you need special court papers to come inside. I was in a stubborn mood, and nobody wins against me when I'm in a stubborn mood. Unless, of course, you're my parents. Cop or not, this man wasn't coming inside the house, or going anywhere near my siblings. That's when he demanded to speak to my parents for the first time. Where are your parents? I want to speak to them about your behavior. He was trying to use the get me into trouble tactic to frighten me. In reality, my mom was far scarier than him. He would have been afraid of my mom because she's the type to kick someone's ass and then ask questions later. But she doesn't play around when it comes to her kids. She wouldn't assault or threaten a police officer, but he would have been in for it because my mom would have unleashed a verbal onslaught. Full-blown Karen mode, level 10. My parents aren't here right now. They're at the grocery store. I had a feeling that he already knew my parents weren't home. Up until then, he hadn't asked for them. I didn't know if he was a cop or not, but I didn't want to aggravate him further by telling him a lie. I know that my behavior was annoying, but I wasn't going to give him a reason to call me a liar. That's when he reached for the screen door and tried to open it. That's when he discovered it was locked. Open the damn door. I said no. I then slammed the door shut so he couldn't ask me again. I snuck halfway up the stairs and listened. He began yanking and tugging on the screen door. Little bitch, I should arrest you and teach you a lesson. After that, 
He just walked through our neighbor's yard like nothing happened. That's when I realized I never saw any cop cars in our driveway. We lived in town homes, so I could see all the vehicles from a distance, and I didn't spot a single cruiser parked nearby. My parents showed up almost right after he left. I told my mom what happened. Well, you shouldn't have opened the door, and you should have called me right away. What's the matter with you? You're grounded. Now come help me with the groceries. I couldn't help but notice that our neighbors checked on us far more often after this incident, and our parents got us a babysitter whenever they left the house without us. I'm not 100% sure, but something tells me that that man who came to the house wasn't a cop, and I would have put my family in danger by allowing him inside. To everyone listening, teach your kids that a uniform is just not enough. You should ask for their badge number and call the police station to verify if you can. It also doesn't hurt to invest in a strong, sturdy screen door. This happened a few years ago to me when I was still living in my childhood home down in California. I had just inherited my family home, so my cousin decided to move in with my husband and I while she was attending a college nearby. My cousin and I were both working at the Lego store at the time, but I only worked mornings and my husband and cousin worked nights, so there were many nights where I was all alone. A couple of weeks before this happened, I had been taking stuff out to my car when I realized a strange brown van with no back windows was parked across the street. As I put the stuff in the trunk, the man in the van started making these weird noises at me. I turned to see if I could get a look at his face but his black giant's baseball cap was pulled down really far. Thinking he was just another creepy guy, I flipped him off and went back into my house. About two hours later, I went outside to go somewhere. He was still parked across the street. Not thinking anything of it at the time, I hopped in my car and headed towards my friend's house. As I was driving, I looked in my rearview mirror, and I now saw that brown van following me. I turned down a whole bunch of streets. He followed me down every single one of them. I turned onto the road that my father-in-law lived on and parked, thinking if the guy tried anything, I could just run in there and be safe. When I pulled over in front of my father-in-law's house, the van slowly drove by. I looked into the van, and the man put his hand into a gun position and pointed at me, and then said bang really loudly. After that, he just hauled ass and drove off. Now, I'd always been a little leery of staying home alone. My house had always given me the creeps because of how poorly lit it was. When I was at home alone at night, I usually just stayed in the kitchen because of how bright it was. I was watching a TV show on my computer when all of a sudden I hear a banging on the front door and the hand began to jiggle. It startled me for a moment until I looked at the time and saw it was around 10 p.m., I knew my cousin was going to be coming home from work about that time, so I got up and opened up the door, but there was nobody on the porch. I shouted my cousin's name, but no response came. I called his cell, and immediately she was like, oh hey, I'm on my way home from work right now. Before I could say anything else, there was three extremely loud bangs on the door that connected the kitchen and the garage, and the knob began to shake violently. I slammed the front door closed, locked and chained it, and then ran from my room. My aunt called me while my cousin called the police, and I stayed under the blanket until my cousin arrived home. When she came and got me, I was led outside to talk to the police. I was trying to explain what had happened, but the officers along the side of my house were distracting me. I walked over to where they were, and one of the police officers held me back. They opened the gate and I saw the door to my garage, which we always leave locked, was now wide open. All of the officers in the area pulled out their guns and went inside, but there was nobody in there. Afterwards, the police told me it was probably just some kids messing around, but if I ever get scared at home, just call them, they'll send someone out. About a week later, I was watching something in my living room with my cousin and my husband. As I was passing by the window next to my front door, I realized there was the same guy 
wearing that same baseball cap, standing outside on the sidewalk, just staring at our house. When he noticed me watching, he immediately locked eyes with me, slowly gave me the creepiest smile I'd ever seen. I turned and yelled for my husband to go out there, but when I turned back, he was gone. I will say though that the baseball cap in question is really, really generic. A lot of Giants fans wear it, so I can't really say it was the same exact guy, but it just felt like it was. Three days after that, I was home alone again. I was on edge, but I was trying to ignore it, telling myself it was all going to be okay. I was baking cookies in the kitchen when I thought I heard a knock at my sliding glass door. My whole body tensed up. I slowly turned towards the door. The lights in the backyard were off and the kitchen ones were on so the glare on the window made it impossible to see someone standing outside. Everything was silent for a few seconds before someone banged on the door again. I screamed, but felt paralyzed in fear. The person ran on the deck from the sliding glass door to the two windows in the living room and then started banging on them as well. Then came back to the sliding glass door to knock and started trying to open the door. Finally, I came to my senses, grabbed my keys and ran outside to my car. I locked myself in it and dialed 911. We sold our house shortly after that. I still have a hard time staying home alone, even though I'm two states away now. When I was in my mid to late 20s, my boyfriend and I took a trip down to St. Augustine, Florida. We both really loved it there due to the antique aesthetic and the rich history behind it all. And with it being the oldest city in America, it couldn't get any better. We stayed at this really nice hotel and walked around the city, exploring the nice museums and just getting away from the modern civilization we're all familiar with. One day in the afternoon, maybe on our second or third day there, we're both in our hotel room when my boyfriend says that he's gonna go to the pool to take a swim. I tell him to go do his thing while I stayed behind to work on a project for my internship. Looking back, I really wish I had gone with him. About an hour into my internship, I take a break and decide to take a nap as this project really sucked the life out of me. I would also made sure my boyfriend knew that I'd be asleep so that he wouldn't come in to wake me up. Long story short, I fall asleep for a good hour or so when I for some reason wake up. I still couldn't figure out as to why I suddenly woke up, but it was kind of like one of those moments where you just awake from a really bad dream or REM sleep. At that point, I get up when I thought I could hear what sounded like breathing coming from somewhere in the room. It was faint, but it sounded echoey to the point where I could hear it clearly. I knew it couldn't have been the AC as we had turned it off the previous night. This made me easily paranoid as I didn't know what it was or where it was coming from and I was definitely not going to go looking for it. So I did the only thing anyone would do. I left the room and got the attention of security from down the hall. I went on to explain that I had heard breathing and didn't know where it was coming from. Security thankfully inspected the room, as well as my boyfriend who had finally come back. However, to my surprise, they had found no one else in the room and couldn't find out what it was. My boyfriend and I just assumed it had to be the AC because apparently earlier that day, he had overheard someone say it had been broken throughout the building. That night we get into bed and go to sleep when a few hours later my boyfriend wakes me up. At first, I wasn't sure what he wanted, but that's when I hear the breathing noises again. The same noises I had heard earlier. This time, I knew my mind wasn't playing tricks on me as I was fully awake. The breathing was a lot louder than before, and that's when my boyfriend pointed to one place that we never checked. The air vent. I watch as my boyfriend goes with his phone to the vent and shines his light inside when he falls back letting out a scream. For a brief second, I could see a face inside the vent. At that point, we run out of that room, getting the attention of hotel management. 
The manager, being the nice person he was, called the police where they then inspected the whole room and took a look at the vent in the wall. Turns out, inside of the closet was a cutout of a small door frame that led into the walls. This made it easy for someone to crawl through and to place the cutout back behind them. Upon finding this, police were able to get through and arrest a man who happened to be the hotel's receptionist. He had been doing this for months, which also meant that he had been watching people change, including me. He was arrested, of course, and the hotel gave us a full refund for our stay, which was a way of pleading for us not to sue them. However, we were decent people and knew it wasn't their fault. Because of this, my boyfriend and I never go to hotels anymore and have stuck with Airbnbs instead. I know, probably not the best idea either, but better than hotels by a landslide. The scariest thing about this was that police had found various photos taken of different people sleeping in the hotel beds inside his house. Thankfully, they didn't seem to find any of me or my boyfriend, but I felt so bad for the people who don't even know. Up until now, I'm always cautious about hidden cameras or rooms in our house. It even came to a point where I'd always check behind the shower curtain, thinking there would be someone there, and the one time you didn't check, someone would be there. Nothing has happened since, but my paranoia always gets the better of me. Anyway, that's our story, and I hope it makes others aware of who could be watching without your knowledge. This took place in October of 2012 when I was 16 years old. For context, I'm a female. I stand 5 foot and am certainly petite. I mention this as this will be important in the story later on. I had gone to visit my grandparents that lived in this really cute cottage in a small town of North Carolina. The name of the town won't be mentioned as I don't want this incident spreading around that town. If I could remember correctly, it was a Friday night and my grandparents had gone out shopping for Halloween decorations. While they never celebrated Halloween, they did enjoy the vibe of it and would commonly give out candy to trick-or-treaters. For some reason, I didn't want to go with them and told them I'd stay here to play on my DS. Back then, the DS was one of the best toys of the year and everyone and their grandma had one. So they leave, and I have the house to myself and try to make the best of it, as I'm almost never home alone. At around 8pm, I'm playing on my DS as usual when I get a knock at the door. Assuming it was probably my grandparents back from their errands, I rush to the door and open it, but instead saw some guy. He looked normal, although a bit nervous, and asked me if my parents were home and that he was here to fix the water heater. I stupidly said that I was alone, and he gives me this wicked smile that sent chills down my spine. I then tell him that he could come back when they were here, and he then puts his foot in the door saying that he could just do it now. At this point, I was clearly uncomfortable, and I'm pretty sure he noticed that I was. Being only 16, I knew what was happening, but I couldn't resist him even if I tried. Like I said, I'm petite, so I wasn't just going to push him away. However, the more I tried to resist him, the more angry he got, as he wasn't taking no for an answer. Now, I'm not one to be rude, but I was intimidated by him, as not only did he appear to be angry, but he was also huge. Not knowing what to do, I was about to run inside the house, but that's when I see a car pull in. It was my grandparents, and my grandpa immediately took notice as to what was going on. He steps out of the car and yells at the man to leave or he won't hesitate to blow his brains out. I see this man bolt away from the house down the road disappearing into the night. After that, I remember them calling the sheriff, but I'm not sure if he ever got caught. The crime rate was very low in this town, so for something like this to happen was extremely rare. I thank my grandparents for arriving when they did. 
If they had arrived even a minute later, God only knows if I'd even be writing this or not. In 2017, I'd heard news of people dressing up as clowns and running around with knives at night. Typically, I brush those things off because I have my own set of problems. I, a 20-year-old female, was often up all hours of the night dealing with my screaming newborn. It was January or February, so we still had some snow. I wasn't able to get out of the house often. Taking out the trash, which is located right next to my back door, was usually the most I got out of fresh air. One morning, I took out the trash and happened to glance over to the right. Noticed footprints directly under the window to my baby's room. I walked over to inspect it, and not only were there footprints, but there were also hand indentations on the window screen. Weird, but the baby slept in my room, so I wasn't very confused at the moment, but my boyfriend was losing his marbles. Fast forward a couple of days, I was up all alone around 3 a.m., and heard not exactly what I would call screaming, but more of a screeching howl. We have lots of stray cats, so I assumed that's what it was and I just ignored it. Once the sun was up, I looked out the window and noticed a few new sets of footprints that really didn't make sense, because it looked like someone had just been passing in between the houses, but again, I blew it off because we had a lot of drug houses across the street, and people cross our yard before they get to their house all the time. Maybe around four nights later, again around 3 a.m., I'm feeding my newborn. I hear a dragging noise against the house, and from where I was sitting on the couch, I could see the back door. The back door has a window with blinds on it, and it doesn't seal very well due to the wood rot on the frame. I pause the TV and listen just to see if I could hear it again, now directly at the back door. Looking over, I can clearly see a looming figure just standing in the window holding one of those big kitchen knives. The blinds were shut, so I'm just seeing this creepy shadow version of all this. He runs the knife across the window panes before softly knocking. Meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out what to do with the newborn latched on because my phone is up in the bedroom and something in me just doesn't want whoever this is out of my vision. I stand up and readjust because I really didn't want a screaming baby right then. And walking into my kitchen, I flick on the light and said, Hey man, I already called the police and I'm sure you don't want to deal with them, so why don't you go home? I really don't know why I talked to him so calmly and normal-like, but I don't think he was expecting anyone to say anything because he just froze. It seemed like he was talking to himself over about it, seeing if it was worth it. Then a few seconds later, he darted off down the alleyway. Never had anything like that happen again but my boyfriend sure was mad I didn't wake him up to handle the situation, or at least actually call the police. I'm not sure if this qualifies as a creepy encounter, but I sure was creeped out once my sleep-deprived self realized what happened, and more importantly, what could have happened. I'm a 36-year-old male, and I live in a ground floor apartment in a seaside town in England with my girlfriend. This incident occurred on a Saturday night. I was home alone because my girlfriend was having an evening out with two friends that she hadn't seen in a couple of months. I'm a night owl at heart, so I like to stay up late on the weekends, and I wanted to wait up anyway just in case her or her friends needed me to drive them home instead of getting a taxi. I'd plan to catch up on some YouTube videos and maybe play a game on my laptop. It was about 10.30pm when I heard the sound of my front door handle moving. I paused the TV and listened, and I heard it again. It sounded like someone was rattling my door handle very quickly. I was confused because I wasn't expecting my girlfriend to be home or call me to pick her up until closer to midnight. So I headed to the door and looked out the peephole. The noise had stopped by the time I reached the door, and when I looked out the peephole, my blood then froze. I saw a man standing further away from my door, facing away from me, so all I could see was the back of his head. It looked like he had his head in his hands. 
I got a bad feeling in my stomach, and I decided to pretend that I wasn't home, figuring it was just some drunk idiot who got the wrong house. I went back to watch TV, but I had kept the noise lower than before. About half an hour passed, and I heard the same noise yet again. I was very on edge, and I immediately shot up and headed for the door. I decided this time that I'd open it, and I didn't ask him what the hell his problem was. I did just that, except when I opened the door, the guy just gave me a bewildered look before backing away. When I opened the door, I said to him, Look man, I don't know who you are, but I saw you trying to open my door earlier. If you don't leave right now, I'm contacting the police. I didn't recognize this man as a neighbor, and his eyes looked tired, with black circles underneath them, and he looked solemn. I stood there watching him as he backed off, before he went to the entryway to our apartment block, and just sat there, head in his hands. I went back into my house, but before I did, I then said, Just go home, man, and then shut the door. I wasn't sure if I should call the police because I didn't want to waste their time if the guy simply had the wrong house, which I felt he maybe had since he looked at me so confused. I shot a text to my girlfriend explaining the situation, and I told her to make sure she calls me when she wants to come home because I didn't want her to get a taxi and risk running into the guy outside. I told her to not cut her night short, and I was fine picking her up at any time and that I'd drive her friends home too if they wanted. I knew she wouldn't be out until 4am because we're both too old to party like that nowadays, but I didn't want her to cut her night short either. I ended up turning the TV off and just sitting on my phone until my girlfriend called just after midnight to say that she was ready to come home. When I went to go get her, the apartment entryway was now empty, as were the stairs leading to the upper floors from what I could see. I didn't see the man again, although I was very vigilant walking along the street to my car. When my girlfriend and I got home, she told me that she thought that he was probably just a drunk and trying to get into a friend's house, and I agreed, although to me he looked more tired than drunk, but I guess you never really know. I have no idea if he knew someone in our apartment block or if he really was trying to do something more sinister. I just hope that he never comes back, and I'm really glad that we always kept our front door locked and bolted, because if I had it unlocked that night, he could have waltzed it right in and done God knows what.